We have the presentation of colors and then the national anthem. Sorry. Sorry about that. Colors, hope, left face, man, Cadet Sergeant Avery Cantor from French Douglas High School, Army Junior ROTC, request permission to present the colors. Request permit permitted. Thank you, man. Colors, reverse, march. I'd like to thank our, our JROTC from Frederick Douglass High School. We'd also like to thank our student performers from Western High School Jazz Band. Were they all here? AJ, where's AJ? Were they all here? Because there were only three here. So we'd like to thank our student performers from Western High School Jazz Band. I have about 14 names, but there were only three. So, so I don't miss anybody. Let's just thank them. Thank you. Now I'd like to um, ask uh, Commissioner Chinia to uh, acknowledge an observance for someone in our family who's passed. Good evening. Um, this evening we'd like to take time to recognize the passing of a retired city school employee. This individual was committed to supporting our students um, through her work and will be rem remembered fondly by the greater city school community. Tonight, we're going to send our deepest condolences to her family and friends. Betty Williams was a homegrown Baltimorean graduating from Dunbar High School in 1941 before going on to Morgan State University, 
where she earned her bachelor's degree and received her master's of education degree from Johns Hopkins University. Betty started teaching English at her alma mater, Dunbar, in 1950, and she continued teaching and leading for 32 years at Booker T. Washington, Lamell Junior High, Northwestern High School, and Eastern High School. Ms. Williams held many positions in the system, beginning as a substitute teacher, a secondary English teacher, or English department head, a special assistant unit school, an assistant principal, principal, and her last assignment was assistant to the regional superintendent until she retired from the district in 1982. Ms. Williams stayed active until her recent passing at 94 years of age. Betty will be missed by relatives, friends, colleagues, former students, and the entire Baltimore City Public School family. I'd ask that you uh, join us in a moment of silence, please. Thank you. I'd like to have a motion uh, to approve uh, open prior uh, minutes from open session. So moved. so moved by Commissioner High Cupboard. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Berkeley. All in favor? Commissioner Pena, Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard. Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima. I'd like to ask for a motion to approve prior closed session summary. Commissioner High Cupboard, second. Commissioner Bondima, all in favor? No, Ashley. Uh, Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, and Bondina. Uh, any re uh, disapprove? Abstention? One abstention. We will not have a report from the, either the Operations Committee or the Teaching and Learning Committee. They have neither has met uh, since the last um, board meeting, but I'd like to ask uh, Commissioner Hassan to say a few words about the upcoming schedule for the Policy Committee. Sure. So. Um, Every year, the board puts together a legislative policy platform that we share with our uh, elected representatives to help support initiatives and, in, and ideas that will help uh, Baltimore City students be successful. In the past, we've developed this legislative platform in dialogue and conversation with ourselves, and then presented it to the community. This year, we're going to go about it in a little bit different way in that we're going to invite um, individuals to join us on Thursday, November 30th at 6 p.m. in this room to provide public testimony and input on what you think are the priorities, what you see as teachers, as principals, as parents, faculty, and um, staff members that might be able to be a support for our students um, from a legislative aspect. So we invite anyone to join us November 30th at 6 p.m. in this room. We will have a board forum and then immediately following the public input session, we'll have a board work session where the 10 of us will discuss what was put on the table, what we think are the priorities, and help percolate down to then a final legislative platform presentation that will be given at a later board meeting. We actually did it last year, but we didn't promote it well, so doing something that nobody knows about is almost like not doing it. Um, so this year we're trying to give you a little bit more heads up, so thanks, Commissioner Hassan. Um, for my uh, comment section, I'd like to invite um, representatives from the Healthy Schools Program to come and talk to us. Good evening. Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you okay. can introduce yourselves and then we'll get started. Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Laura Howard. I am a senior program manager at Kaiser Permanente. Hello. Hello. Um, and it is my hello. It is my distinct honor to be able to present to you tonight, along with my colleague from the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, about the Healthy Schools Program. Um, 
Kaiser Permanente, whom I work for, is really investing in the health and wellness of Baltimore City and Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, and the Alliance has been a great example of that partnership. Um, we want to address the uh, social determinants of health, uh, which is making the healthy choice the easy choice by looking at the mental, physical, and spiritual aspects. Um, of the policies and practices and behaviors and environments that affect health and wellness. And so we have been had the privilege of partnering with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation for the past three years uh, for to implement their Healthy Schools program in Baltimore City Schools. And so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Naja Agnew, who is the program manager for the Healthy Schools program. Thank you, Laura. Um, as Laura said, I, my name is Naja Agnew, and I'm the Healthy Schools program manager with the Alliance for Healthier Generation. And I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to share just a little bit about the Healthy Schools program in Baltimore City. The Alliance has worked closely with city schools over the past um, few number of years through the Healthy Schools program. And schools currently enrolled in on-site support with the Alliance have been supported since 2014 through this grant with the Alliance, between the Alliance and Kaiser Permanente. So thank you again for this opportunity to share just a little bit about this uh, unique collaboration and some of the great successes we've seen in our schools. So the Healthy Schools program helps to create and sustain healthy school environments where students, especially those in greatest need, can learn more and flourish. So why schools? Well, as we know, every day 95% of school-aged children attend school, and outside the home is where they spend most of their time. And research shows that um, there's a strong link between a young person's adoption of healthy habits, including good diet, regular physical activity, and the adoption of lifelong healthy habits. And active kids, um, when kids are physically active, they perform better in school, they have better attendance, and their behavior improves. And so we do this, we support schools, we guide schools by um, to help them implement policies and programs that meet both federal requirements, but also local health and wellness goals around increasing healthy eating and physical activity. All of this is provided free of charge through on-site school visits, um, in-person workshops with technical assistance, and larger events that we call summits that highlight professional development opportunities for school wellness leaders. In Baltimore City, I support 25 schools that are enrolled in this on-site support model. Um, all of my schools are Title I, and it's both elementary, middle, and high school. Um, in addition to that, we also support schools through our online program, so any school can join the Healthy Schools program free of charge, access the same resources and tools, and be matched with a virtual program manager. So we can really support any number of schools. Additionally, we support schools um, over the past four years, we've worked closely with the district to support all city schools through a unique collaboration um, with the development and implementation of the district wellness policy, as well as providing trainings for health educators and physical education teachers around increasing physical activity in the classroom and establishing school wellness committees. And we've seen great success in Baltimore City. Um, with the schools I work with, the 25 schools, um, last year, as of last year, nearly 100% of our elementary schools um, in my cohort had at 20, 20 minutes of recess per day, and 50% offered physical activity breaks in the classroom on most days. Around healthy eating, 70% sell um, only foods that meet the USDA smart snack standards during the school day. And these are all pieces that are in the, that district wellness policy, the Baltimore City District Wellness Policy. In addition, 65% use at least five smarter lunchroom techniques, which are a collection of strategies used to help um, increase uh, consumption of school lunch and fruits and vegetables. Um, in addition to supporting schools to make healthy changes, we also help schools recognize and celebrate their successes, both large and small. And one of our greatest successes this year was Belmont Elementary School, which um, applied for and received the National Healthy Schools Bronze Award, which was amazing, and also highlighted their um, unique achievement around health and wellness. To give you kind of a sense of the um, importance of this award and the prestige of it, over 35,000 schools are enrolled in the Healthy Schools program, and only 323 received this award. So Belmont is in a very elite class of schools prioritizing health and wellness. Um, and I just want to share two very short success stories um, with two of our other schools. One was the Edgecombe Circle Elementary School, where the school wellness leader was really looking for a way to develop a sustainable staff wellness program um, and to create staff buy-in around health and wellness. 
so he met um, through one of our workshops. He talked with other school wellness leaders and decided to start a weekly lunch for staff. So he brought in soup every week, understanding that if you want people to come to a meeting, you have to provide delicious food. Um, and so during those meetings, they started talking about their wellness priorities and their interests. And through this, he developed a, um, a really strong school wellness council that um, not only provided um, a staff fitness room, working with local partners, but this year is really using the momentum and the buy-in from the staff to expand after school physical ac activity opportunities for students with the hopes of really expanding that even further to engage uh, parents and families next. And finally, uh, another great example of how we're reaching kind of beyond the 25 schools that I work with directly is I've worked um, over the past four years with the district to um, help uh, provide technical assistance to implement the district wellness policy. And one way we did that was to bring in one of our national content advisors to provide training to over uh, 70 health and PE teachers um, at a PD day last year. So we worked closely and we developed a train the trainer concept to really bring this training back to the schools um, to increase brain boost and other active lessons. And this helped you know, all these schools implement the ECPS wellness, nutrition, and physical activity policy. So thank you so much. I hope I haven't gone over. Um, thank you for the time to just share a little bit about our successes, and I look forward to supporting all the city schools this year. Questions? I, I had a question. Yes. Um, do you, how do you, you said you're tw in 25 schools? Yes. How do you d select the schools? I believe it was, it was before, um, it was a previous program manager, but I believe it was with, um, in collaboration with the district level, with district staff, based on um, kind of principal readiness and interest in wellness adoption. Um, yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about that. So um, when Kaiser first started, approached the Alliance, we knew that we wanted to do a large cohort of 25 schools in Baltimore City proper. So the um, program manager at the time really had to sort of start from scratch with identifying schools and the relationships. So it kind of became a first come, first serve okay. and who was willing to sign up. Because um, believe it or not, as I'm sure you know, that sometimes you can have resources and people just don't have the capacity to really be able to take them and run with them. So that's where the schools were initially chosen. Um, the program is a four-year program. So this current cohort of 25 schools is going to be rolling off in the next year. One thing that we're going to be providing them um, with is a virtual program manager, which is not typical for um, school schools as they roll off. That's a new program that Kaiser Permanente is piloting with the Alliance. Um, but it will open up the opportunity to identify a few new schools that we could potentially enroll in the program again. We know that we want to um, identify some schools in Baltimore City, and we're particularly looking at the 21223 zip code at schools there, but that's our goal. Because it, it just struck me, and I'm, I'm looking at Commissioner Hassan while I say this, it just struck me as this is a very helpful thing to help schools implement the wellness policy. So it, it, it seems like it's nicely aligned. On the, I know that the healthy eating is only one part of it, albeit a, an important part, and so I wondered on that, is there collaboration with Maryland Hunger Solutions and Share Our Strength and the other people that are sort of focused on the food side, the breakfast, all, all that. I mean, because since there is a food component, I'm imagining in some of those schools you bump up against some of those other partners and I wondered if you work, and you probably are, Laura, you're probably supporting all those people too. So yeah. is there a connection? Is there a relationship between these two things? Um, I think I, in looking at the big picture, yes. I mean, we've obviously worked with, um, you know, Maryland uh, Partnership for Hunger um, and supported it in different schools. I'm not sure how, I, I think it would manifest differently in each individual school and you can speak to that, Naja. Absolutely. So I know when I, the schools that I work with that have, for example, the, the food pantry at their school, they work with the Maryland Food Bank. And I've worked with, um, you know, I've spoken with their program managers there. Um, and in general, our program really focuses on food in schools. So we work closely with the food nutrition department and um, and the staff and the and the district staff and the community partners on the school wellness council, um, the district wellness council, to kind of make sure that um, the work that we're doing in the schools aligns with 
you know, the overall district goals of implementing the school, you know, the district wellness policy. So I've worked with, um, you know, food nutrition services quite a bit to make sure that, you know, their information is getting disseminated to the schools and to make sure that the schools, you know, have a way of getting information um, and feedback back to food nutrition services as well. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does. I, I was thinking about the, the, the resistance we've had in, in a lot of our schools to the breakfast before the bell, which mm -hmm. is an, a, a component that is, that's been hard to implement, and it, it, that could be considered food during this, at the mm -hmm. school if people were doing it. And so I was wondering if, if having a partnership with you helped nudge that along a little bit since the partner who's really tr pushing that hasn't been as successful. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. resistance at the school level, and I was kind of hoping that you were going to say, "Yeah, that <laughs> we're 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 getting that done." But I didn't hear you say that. So yeah, I, I think traditionally the um, breakfast breakfast in the classroom and breakfast before the bell has fallen in the hunger realm versus the healthy choice realm, um, and a lot of the healthy schools program really relies on where the momentum is within the school, and if the school doesn't have the momentum or the impetus to really try and implement something like that, it's, v it's very difficult to come in, but that's not to say that we can't start nudging. Yeah, and I hate to, see, I mean, I, I can appreciate it. I just hate to see a separation between hunger and health. Yeah. Like, no, it's a, it's saying. an excellent point. It's yeah. an excellent point. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. So at this time, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a couple of gifts to city schools. Uh, Acknowledgement of a $5,000 to be used for the PBIS incentive room at Johnston Square Elementary from True Capital Management. And acknowledgement of a gift of $5,000 towards the Gifted and Talented program at Callaway Elementary from Toyota Financial Services. So thank you for those partners and come one, come all. If you have something you'd like to contribute, we'll take it. Um, I'd now like to ask for a motion to approve um, the personnel, PEP agenda, and the qua and quasi-judicial matters, uh, the three appeals and hearings cases. Do I have a do I have a motion to approve, Commissioner High Cupboard? Second. Commissioner Bondima, all in favor. Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, Bondima. Uh, oppose, abstain, one abstention. Okay, passes. Nine to zero to one. I would now like to turn to the CEO for her comments. Good evening. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to invite um, the Chief Human Capital Officer. Um, Jeremy Grant Skinner uh, to the table for tonight's PEP agenda. Good evening, Commissioners and Dr. Santelises. Uh, there are five appointments this evening. First, uh, Kira Ritter, most recently President and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of the Greater Chesapeake is appointed Special Assistant to the Chief of Staff, effective November 21st. Is Kimberly she, Felton Pittman. Is she, is she here? She is, I believe, not here. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Kimberly Felton Pittman is appointed Assistant Principal at KIPP Harmony, effective November 15th. She also is not here. Okay. Next, Charles Hall, currently manager of school-based staffing, is appointed director of employee services, effective November 15th. And he is here. Anthony Felder, currently manager of school operations support, is appointed interim principal of Walter P. Carter Elementary Middle School, effective November 15th through June 30th, 2018. Thank you. And Melissa Smith, currently guidance counselor at Excel Academy, is appointed assistant principal at Excel Academy, effective November. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to um, also, I want to uh, congratulate everyone um, on tonight's PEP agenda and just want to say um, a welcome to um, Interim Principal Felder. Um, and as folks know, when someone is appointed to the principalship, I make particular note. And in this case, um, everyone should know um, that Mr. Felder uh, served for seven years as a principal uh, prior to returning to uh, be manager of school operations with six of those years as principal of Gwynn Falls Elementary School right here in Baltimore City. Um, Mr. Felder is a native of Baltimore and a product of city schools. If you ever get the chance to ask him about his trajectory, um, Mr. Felder represents um, the potential of all of our young people in city schools, and it is a privilege to welcome him back, um, not only to city schools, but in helping us out as the interim principal um, here. So Mr. Felder states, I believe in the children of Baltimore City and understand their story because I am their story. I know they can achieve because I did. He holds a bachelor's degree from Coppin State University and a master's degree from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Welcome back, Mr. Felder. And I will let everybody know that we've already received complaints because some of his principal colleagues for whom he was serving as manager were highly upset um, that he was going back to a school. So he is in high, high demand. So thank you. Uh, last week, uh, the district issued uh, proposed revisions um, to policy JBB uh, regarding sex-based discrimination against students um, at a meeting of the Parent and Community Advisory Group. Board. These revisions included extensive additions uh, specific to issues of gender identity. Um, after consulting the board, I am recommending that the revised policy uh, be removed from today's agenda to allow time for staff to work through the complexities of implementation and provide sufficient opportunities for feedback from the larger school community. Um, but I do want to be clear um, that there's no question um, about whether we will protect all of our students um, from forms of discrimination. The question at hand is how we will do so in the most thoughtful way possible. Our stance on discrimination against any student is clear. We will not tolerate any form of discrimination, harassment, or intimidation based on race, religion, nationality, or sexual identity. Our challenge though, is to identify the specific, the, the specific steps necessary to meet the needs of our transgender community while remaining mindful of and respectful toward the rights of all. There are issues surrounding privacy for all students, implementation nuances, and a host of similar questions to be considered. Uh, these issues do need to be thought through, discussed, and resolved with input from our students, um, large number of stakeholders, including representatives from the LGBTQ community um, and their advocates. Uh, we and I uh, remain committed to making sure um, that this engagement occurs in a manner that is inclusive and as transparent as possible. As this process unfolds, we're going to continue to be vigilant in protecting the rights of our transgender community and all students in city schools. I encourage anyone who feels threatened, harassed, or intimidated for any reason, um, any reasons, uh, particularly of gender identity or any other cause, to make sure that they contact our EEO office. And I give you uh, my assurance that your concerns will be addressed. Um, but again, we look forward to the process of, of further engaging uh, the larger community in some of the more implementation details, but our commitment to the community uh, remains steadfast. And that concludes my comments for the evening. Great. Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is to um, ask the board to, to walk through the proposed consent agenda items and ask the board if there are any items to be pulled. Let's, let me find them first here. Let's see. The first. You keep going. I just wanted to. 
find out. Are we doing special recognitions now, or you want to do that later? You said you didn't have anything else. Sorry, I thought you were going to ask for special recognitions. So but we'll hold. We'll. We're okay. We're okay. We're okay. Okay. We're okay. She's the first thing under item under the next item. Special recognitions are the first thing under the next item. You're, you're going the right way. Okay. Great. We're okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right, consent agenda. Uh, the first item is the Fairmont Hartford, Har Hartford building, building. There's no need to pull that because we are going to have a presentation about that, so there will be time to ask questions about that item. Uh, we have uh, quite a few um, 11 items from the chief academic officer. Um, and I know we have a number of questions in them, so I'll start with the first one. And, and so. Yeah, let's just say. Do, let me start by asking if there's anybody who has any questions on the group as a whole uh, for these items. Because I, I know that Andy, I know you do and I do. Does anybody else have questions on the group as a whole? All right, so let's start with Commissioner Frank. Okay. So I think we'd like to propose that we pull this entire group for some common questions. Um, for me, they fall <coughs> under things like the relationship between this list, who am I talking, I guess, uh, the, the relationship between this list, which is really varied and hard to f follow as a collection, and what I thought was our focusing on the blueprint. I feel like we're, we're, we're really buying into the blueprint as a vision, and it was just really hard to tell what the relationship is between us saying we're going to get this done and we're going to really elevate literacy and what feels like a really confusing array of options. Um, and then I had a second question that had to do with how we're paying for these. Um, we know that there's not enough money to do all the things we want to do. Um, so if, if we were to start to, to have some strong opinions about uh, professional development from a central standpoint to align with the blueprint, might we look at how we can use Title II maybe differently and more strategically centrally as opposed to paying for this out of Title I? Now, I'm going to admit that I'm exposing some of my ignorance on Title II versus Title I, but I understand Title II can be used for professional development, and I, this feels like a big, giant bucket of professional development that seems like it should be aligned with the blueprint, which I'm thinking we have some central thoughts on. So I, I, I really want to have that conversation um, when we look at these items. And those are my main two. Commissioner Hassan, and then we'll have Commissioner Canham, yeah, and then we'll Commissioner Frank. Uh, yeah, I, I am interested in seeing just how this all fits together and how we're going to ensure that um, while we have autonomy in choice, consistency in message, especially around the literacy plan and things like that. Uh, and then also just to make sure that we are doing our due diligence and don't end up in a situation where Baltimore County is, uh, just some verification that, there, that no one in city school staff was paid to sit at a meeting and any evaluator here from any of these vendors. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I actually, when I read this, the, the five components, I, I thought that they aligned nicely with the blueprint. I, my my um, reaction was, and I'm excited about it, it's a lot of support to our principles and literacy, the, the things we've talked about. My question is 10 vendors as opposed to five. Have we chosen 10 because we think 10 will provide better services than five? And do we have the capacity really to to sort of evaluate, monitor, manage 10 different vendors in what is three or four components each over a three year period. And are we evaluating them on an annual basis or are we evaluating them at the end of three years, which is probably too long? And just really the basic question, the capacity within your team to make sure that they're providing outstanding service to us and they need, you know, monitoring. Commissioner? Uh, uh, actually, yeah. a lot of my questions have been asked, but 
it, even after reading them a second time, it was hard to, it's the same, how does it fit in and how is this strategic? Um, you know, we have eight vendors for principal coaching. I added them up, seven for team leadership development, five for literacy leadership. So, and, and uh, those are just a couple examples, like how um, it really is evaluating the effectiveness. And then when I looked at their effectiveness to select them, a lot of it was school-based examples, like the lead to teach example. So, you know, some, some anecdotes. So I was just kind of, uh, of school by school. So it's just like, you know, it is the strategic question. Like, why is this the right, um, why are these the right bets? And I understand that that, that, that schools choose them, but even if they're choosing so many different ones, how does it, how, how does this help us move the ball? So what I'd like to propose is that we, we pull them collectively so that we can have some central questions. I'm not hearing any, people might have questions on some specific items, but let's cross that bridge when we come to it, because I think th these questions have to do with the collection. People comfortable with that? I also want to acknowledge the work of the Teaching and Learning Committee, because I know that they had this, some of this conversation at the Teaching and Learning Committee, but I think in this case, uh, given that this is the first significant investment we're being asked to make that is related to really aligning our work with the new blueprint, I, I think it's important for us to all have some of that conversation and to have it with the uh, larger general public. So it's not to disrespect the work of the committee, Commissioner Chinia. I think it just we want to we have a lot of questions. I, I would not disagree with you at all. And in fact, I think um, staff did a credible job with the committee in terms of explaining um, the alignment and Good. things. So I'm looking forward to letting everyone hear that. Good. Thanks. Now, since we started our new board meeting structure, uh, having the things we just did, the presentation of colors, the review of the consent agenda, et cetera, um, we've, we've tried to hold to a schedule that has us starting the public comment at 6 o'clock. Um, it's really important to me that we be respectful of the, the public who shows up for meetings and has a certain expectation of timing and ability to comment. If we start now, we'll be 15 minutes ahead of time. Um, so. I guess I'm going to ask a general question. This is a little unusual. Can I just? Well, Commissioner, we, we, the list is full. We have the list. There are 10 people signed up. We still have the special recognitions that happened first. I, I so know. We, we I, I, don't know if, I don't know if all these 10 people are here. Sometimes people might sign up and they might leave. So what I was going to say was I'd like to uh, start now with the rest of the agenda. If somebody's name is called and they're not here, um, we won't, you won't lose your spot. We will, uh, you know, we will come back to it. I just wanted to respect that if somebody wasn't here, I, I really don't want to disrespect the fact that we are starting a little bit early. So if that's okay with people, we're going to just proceed. I'm getting a thumbs up from my favorite teacher, Providence, in the front <laughs> row, so it must be okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, AJ. Um, so we'll go next to Dr. Santelisis for some special recognitions. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kashani. Um, <clears throat> first, um, I want to recognize one of our longest serving staff members in the Office of Human Capital, um, A.J. Fenwick. And is A.J. here? Susan? Yeah, I told him he better be here this morning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and part of what's so amazing, and I learned this in a meeting that I had recently where AJ did a fantastic job um, as usual in his presentation, um, but that AJ began his career as a work-study student in human capital in 1999. Um, at that time, AJ's mother worked in our ITD department and suggested to the board office that her technology savvy son would be a great addition to any team. Since then, AJ has worked as an HCIS specialist and now serves as an analyst for HRIS, where he is responsible for managing all of the human capital data in our human resource information system. God bless him. I don't know how he does that. Um, AJ plays a critical role in managing human capital data through the budget process, helps the district stay current with our state reporting requirements, and is responsible for developing enhanced to improve our human resource information system. 
AJ is absolutely a team player whose deep knowledge of our systems is matched by his kind personality and constant efforts to improve our service to employees. I can also attest personally to AJ's patients because um, he never reminds me that he has already um, reviewed something with me when he has to review it again. He just <laughs> kindly does it and doesn't uh, show, uh, show just how far off I can be. Uh, we are proud of the impact that AJ's work has had on the Office of Human Capital and City Schools. And I would like him to come forward so we can publicly thank him for his service of nearly 18 years and counting. So, this is National Education Week, so it is only fitting that we honor City Schools 2017 Teacher of the Year, Justin Holbrook. Mr. Holbrook is a fourth grade math and science teacher at Roland Park Elementary School. He had a trail of young people. Um, coming out to the state uh, award dinner uh, where he was a finalist. He was a previous finalist for City Schools Teacher of the Year honors, and this year he was a finalist for Maryland State Teacher of the Year. Um, the committee, I think what really happened was they felt bad in giving a three-peat to Baltimore <laughs> City. But for us, and I turned to Justin at the end and to his both his mom and dad, um, who were there, and I said, I just want you to know for us, you are our Teacher of the Year. Um, there's a lot more I could say about Mr. Holbrook's excellence as a teacher, but I'll let his students do the talking in this wonderful two-minute video. What about a quarter? How much is a quarter? Parallel. Make them bend away from each other. Oh, well then make them bend and then come back across. There you go. So what do you need to know? We need to know the total. You need to know the total number of coins, right? Yeah. The largest thing I try to do is meet every kid on their, on their level, and I think that starts with personal relationships with each one of them. Uh, I try to develop a connection with every single one of my students, no matter who they are, where they come from. Um, that's the basis of my teaching. Mr. Holbrook, like, he gives us math, but when he gives us math, he makes it fun. Say if we have to do a football head made with area things. He lets us like color it and like talk while we do it, but talk silent. I like that he really understands kids and that he understands how kids feel and how we want to get active and don't want to sit in the classroom all the day. Okay, it's all about how you work with people not always about how smart you are. And then additionally, instructionally, brain-targeted teaching is my framework that I use, which is a six-target system that's used for planning, implementing, and teaching lessons. And it's all driven through brain science and how the brain learns and how that should be connected to instruction. Something regular in life, he, he turns it into something that's different and special. 16, 55, 15, 45, 40. Anytime you just give a kid content without connecting it to something that they know or something that they can internalize, they're not going to remember it. He gives us our report cards, but we get to give him a report card of what he can improve and what he is good at. 24, 27, 30, 33, uh-huh, 36, uh-huh. He's just a really nice teacher. I think that says it all, <clears throat> and it is just a reminder that um, what you choose when you choose to focus on the strengths and the stars within city schools, you actually get to see the brilliance of the whole system. 
And so it is now my great pleasure to call upon Justin Holbrook to receive his recognition as 2017 Teacher of the Year for City Schools. That is the end of the special recognitions for this evening. Great, thanks, and congratulations to both of you. Um, it's nice to see people recognize before they leave, like just to say, good job. So I like that. Are we doing this? Is this a new thing yeah. we're going to do? Yeah, this is, a, this is great. <laughs> we're loving it. Uh, Commissioner Hassan has a comment on this. So congratulations, <laughs> Justin. Um, in addition to his work in schools, uh, many of you know that Justin is the founder of the Baltimore Ed Chat. And for anyone who has not noticed, our illustrious CEO will be taking over the chat tomorrow night. So I invite and encourage everyone to join us. Thank you very much. And, and I will say an extra thank you. I don't know why Justin is trusting me um, to, to take his, like, how many thousands of people do you have following you now? He's got 3,000 people following him. So to be able to share his stage, I consider an honor. Well, Dr. Santelli says, I trended when I took it over. Oh. So there's a challenge. Oh, see, well, there we go. <laughs> You've set the bar high, Commissioner Hassan. You've set it high. Yeah, raise your hand if you even know what she's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Have at it, everybody. <laughs> cool. That's very cool. So, um, before we go to general public comment, we have we always have time for uh, some of our special guests. So we, uh, one of our favorites is uh, Trish Garcia Pilla from the from PCAB. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, just really quickly, um, I'd like to let everyone know our our. Next public meeting is this Thursday, November 16th. Uh, so go to the budget form tomorrow night so you can come to PCAB on Thursday night. <laughs> um, and uh, we will have uh, Jill from Arts Every Day at our meeting to talk about um, the initiative with city schools that in order to get arts into every school in the district. Uh, and then we will have James Torrance, who is a staff specialist, um, coming to present uh, and get feedback on the calendar that he's introducing here tonight. He'll be at PCAB on Thursday night to actually get feedback from the public on the calendar. So if people hear about it tonight and have things to say, come Thursday. Uh, also, let me get back to the agenda. We did have presentations um, on the things that are coming up for first reader tonight, the FFA and JFA. I believe we actually had presentations at PCAB on those uh, probably at the end of last school year last year, I feel like. But we definitely have given feedback on those uh, on those uh, po policies that are coming up, um, and I also just wanted to thank Dr. Sanalisis for your statement on the JBB. Uh, I know parents and students; um, it's been a long time, and there's some frustrations over the process, and so that was really nice to hear from you regarding the JBB and we look forward to what's to come We're, and that we know and understand that it's going in the right direction finally so we're excited about that even though it has been a, lo a little bit of a of a stretch to get there um, and finally I just want to say congratulations also to Justin um, I was fortunate enough to have one of my three have Mr. Holbrook. And just to let the public know, uh, we at Roland Park feel like he's the teacher of the year every year that he's been at Roland Park. And 
when you get that letter in August, when you're about to be have a kid in the fourth grade, and you see you got Mr. Holbrook, oh man. Every person at that school, it's like winning the Mega Millions and the Powerball all at the same time. That's so he is very, very, very well deserving of this award and we're very proud of him. So thanks Justin for being awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Trish, and I want to highlight something that she that you said. Uh, she referenced the um, the forums on the sort of review of the budgeting process, the fair student funding model. Um, I should have said something about that earlier, but there is a session to, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. at Douglas High School, yes. and Thursday night at 6 p.m. at Poly. Even though people should go to the PCAB meeting, there is an option to go to Poly for the budget hearing. Yes. Thanks. Our next guest is uh, George Hendricks, representing the BTU. Good evening, everyone. Madam Commissioner, Board Chairs, Dr. Santalisis, all of the folks. I'll bring you greetings from Marietta English, as well as the uh, teachers and paraprofessionals that we represent. Um, I've been in front of the board a few times, and I normally always have, you know, something good that I would like to say first, and then I'll go into the stuff that I have an issue with. So in the sake of time, I'm not going, I'm just going to go into the stuff I have an issue with today, because um, I have to get out of here, but I am, I am here, and I, I hope that you take heed. Um, there are really a lot of issues, uh, but specifically I want to talk about um, two things that have come across uh, my, my desk as well as my colleagues' desk. Uh, through the course of the school year. Um, the first being, of course, and I'm glad to hear, to hear about the, the uh, panels tomorrow for, to talk about the budgets. Um, that, that's a real big, real big one. Um, we do know that there are people who are still being moved around, um, and now we're in the second quarter of the school year. Uh, that's very problematic. You know, we have uh, staff members who are already burnt out. Uh, we have people who are seeking services from EAP, and those things should not happen. So along the lines of the budget, I have to definitely speak along the lines of the uh, class size. Uh, there was a school that I visited early in the school year where this particular employee had 50 kids on roll. And that particular day, uh, I think it was 42 present. And this was a, pre this was a kindergarten class. Um, and for people not to know about it or to move somebody in November, when that particular employee needed help in September and October is, is mind-boggling to me. And that's not just the only school, by the way. I have emails from staff members talking about class size, 37 kids in a class. So I do actually board now, and I actually tried to reach out to find this. There's a particular article in the agreement between city schools and the Board of School Commissioner, uh, Article 7.6, and it says, the pupil-teacher ratio slash class size shall be established by BCPSS based upon financial and student needs. Class size, as reported in the budget, shall be posted. So my question to you, board members, is what's the class size, and when will we find out and when will they be posted? Um, because having that many people in the classroom is ridiculous. And we say that we care about the students, and we all do care about the students because they come to work every day. But that particular teacher that had 50 kids on roll, she was being held to the exact same standard as every other teacher, and that's not fair. That's not fair at all. When she had her first observation done, it, they didn't say, well, we just want to do half of your class. That was our first, our whole class that she had the observation with. So all of those things actually work together when we're talking about the education of our kids. So I ask that you please take a look at those two things, looking at the time that it takes for budget adjustments to be done. Um, you pl you're plucking people up after they already ex established procedures and things with their students and relationships that, that, that we just talk about. Um, we spent a whole two months getting a relationship with our students, and now and all of a sudden I have to move somewhere else. I understand the budget adjustments needs to happen because it's just money, but it has to happen in a quicker, more efficient way, and definitely that class size. So please answer that question for me. I'm looking for that answer as to what is the posted class size for the pupil-teacher ratio. Thank you very much. 
Just a quick question. Can you, which document are you referencing? You, you, you referenced a section of a specific document. Yes, ma'am. That is the, uh, the agreement, the, the, the teacher's contract, the agreement between Baltimore Teachers Union and the Baltimore City School Board Commission. Because he said between the school system and the Baltimore mm -hmm. School Commissioners, and I wasn't sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There are a number of other groups that we, we don't have signups for, so I'm going to read the list, and if there's somebody here who wants to speak on behalf, you can let us know. Uh, PTA Council of Baltimore City, uh, AFSME, Pizzazza, CUB, Associated Student Congress for Baltimore City, CCAC. Okay, those groups are always welcome to sign up in the same way that uh, PCAB and the Teachers Union signs up. Um, okay. So now we'll, we'll move to uh, general public comment at 6.02. First up is uh, Tony Grace. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm Tony Grace, I'm with Youth as Resources. I'm Dante Allen, I represent Youth as Resources also. Um, so Youth as Resources is a youth-led nonprofit grant-making organization. We give grants to young people up to ages 24. Um, our grants range from $500 to $3,500. And we, we give grants to um, the youth and so they can address critical community problems um, and we have a issue agenda where we work on different issues such as disability awareness um, school climate um, school police accountability and things like that and we work with BAP um, around school police accountability um, um, and we just wanted to make sure that the new school police policy um, included some of the input from the youth in the schools and we wanted to include some of the things that we have learned over the past two years we're working with this issue. Based on our work, we are recommending the following be included in the new policy and general orders. A commitment to administer the school police report card once per school year and share results with youth. Include the next report card, a section where students can report incidents of use of force. Any student police interaction result in a complaint and or disciplinary action so involve an incident report that is shared with students for comment and a clear policy around use of force for school police can and cannot do. Also, we wanted to add school police receive mandatory youth-led and informed trainers on topics to include youth um, development best practices, um, disability awareness, and implicit bias. Also, um, clear and consistent consequences for officers who do not follow um, what is outlined in the policy. Um, and that's all we wanted to say. Excuse me. Those are pretty clear recommendations. Do, you, do we have those in writing? So I know, so I'm really glad you came to the board meeting tonight to speak, so thanks very much. I know that um, uh, Joe Strake on my staff who's um, writing the policy has been working really hard to try to uh, connect with Julie to try to set up a time to meet with you all to consult, and I know he's been working uh, uh, over a, a while to try to set that up, and I, we, uh, uh, so we, we want that meeting to happen, so we, we're anxious for it to, to happen. And so let's meet afterwards. I think Joe's in the back, maybe he can connect with you at the end to figure out a time that would work. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, another question, if you could wait just a qu No, I just wanted to make sure they were finished because you guys were asking them questions before their time was up. I'm not trying to call anybody out. I just want to make sure you all are finished. Yeah, we, she, you were she said that was okay. all we... Yeah, I, I, I'll make we, sure. We stopped when she said that's all we have to okay, say. Okay, I want to make sure. Thank you. Okay. Then I have a response to you. Do you see what I'm saying? Thank you. Yep. Great. Thanks a lot. Next guest is Romel Gaynor. What I have to say is concerning something I spoke on before, as well as what he, the brother just said about the class size. I'm dealing with curriculum. I was going to speak on it, but I'm going to read what I wrote. 
So once again, changing the curriculum is my and should be all of our concern, not unless we have no problem with the constant burial of our children, male and female. Our children suffer because they are being taught the same lies that have been taught since our enslavement here as well as so-called public schools began. Actual fact, truth is needed to bring out the genuine and real intelligence that is in all children. Educare or educo means to bring forth or bring out. It is the Latin root of the word we use, which is educate. Now you tell me if our children are taught to bring out their intelligence or are they trained to do as they are told and submit to the rule of this aristocracy. And I'm say this, if we don't change this curriculum that is forced on all children to maintain the global system of racism, pale so-called supremacy, which is used to control all melanated people worldwide, we will be ruled. I'll say this, due to their finding out that their demelanated existence made them the minority globally, some chose to use force and miseducation of all who won't submit to their ability to kill en masse people of all nations that don't bow down to this system. Therefore, I will say this lastly, that if the truth of all history, his slash story or our slash story, is not placed in this curriculum to better all children, we, through our youth, will be destroyed mentally, physically, and mainly spiritually. Now, what are we going to do? And we have been in psychological warfare now for quite a while. Now, when will we fight back with our own psychological methods to overcome this madness? That's all I have to say about it, because what I see, our children are in survival mode. They're miseducated. They live in poverty. They're hungry. They need things. And what you see in those streets is the result of that. That's all I had to say. You know, hopefully, I didn't hear anything last year. Hopefully, I might hear something this year. If not, I'm just keep coming. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Our next guest is Carlos Medrano. Did I say that right? Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good evening. My name is Carlos Medrano. I'm a student representative of Digital Harbor. Um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Having our senior counselor sur surplused was a very devastating, heartbreaking, and absolutely very disruptive decision made by Digital. I wanted to share with you the events that occurred while I was recovering. I was a victim of a tragic event. Um, so during the time of healing my wounds, um, I was granted a surprise, a, pr a surprise visit from my school counselor. She didn't only come as a friend, she came as a very concerned individual that wanted to, that cared about my health and was worried about um, my, my college application process. See, at the time, um, I was very injured and I couldn't, I wasn't able to be very concerned about applying for college at the moment because all I was really focused about was being um, well. Um, this action shows she is one of, it just shows how much determined and caring and passionate counselor she is. See, um, during recovery, coming from multiple platforms of social media, I have seen many demonstrations of advocacy and concern for our counselors. It honestly amazes me how many students really care for our school and it goes to show how decisions from our school could emotionally impact digital students. We have received about one third of school support by having them sign a petition. Um, and we also organized um, flyers to let students know to come to this meeting and support and to help bring our counselor back. Um, students of digital, please stand. Thank you. This isn't an issue censored to only our senior counselor. It is a school-wide issue that 
other public schools face. Having teachers, staff members, and our counselors change positions throughout the year is an issue that needs to be solved in an appropriate manner. This decision has been absolutely very disruptive towards students, especially seniors applying for college, myself included. The timing of the surplusing was very off. This was the first, this was the time when seniors needed to send their transcripts, essays, and letters of recommendation to universities. Ultimately, students should have a say in the decisions that are being made in the school and education. Even though students can't have a vote or finalize their choices, the people who are, who are should hear what the students think about the situation. In conclusion, students should be able to voice their thoughts and concerns in the schools. Thank you. Thank you. So, so one of the things I was going to ask is for, yes it is, thanks. Um, I was going to ask if you have had the chance to meet with the administration at your school at all about this prior to you coming this evening. So when I returned back to school uh -huh. after healing, um, I did. I had a around a, a hour long meeting with our principal and, and had some Input from input from teachers and other administration, and she could have she shared some of our some of her information, but not all of it. And I understand as a position as a principal, you have things that you can and can't do, in which I understand. But yes, I have. Okay, um, because it is a difficult it is a difficult time of year. So I will say that. Um, and as a number of speakers have referenced already, um, for the last, I would say, nine or ten years since we've had fair student funding, this time of year um, is difficult for all the reasons that you just said. Because there are faculty, there are staff, there are teachers um, who you all have relationships with, which frankly should be the most important thing. Um, one of the things that we are looking into is, is there a different way? after 10 years of doing it this way um, to do what we're calling budget adjustments. And so what happens is based on how many young people, how many students enroll in a school, we adjust. And in the case of some schools, a drop in enrollment, a drop in the number of students means that there's a drop in the money to be able to pay for particular positions. Um, but I want you to know that um, as we are taking a look at this process this year, this is one of the things that we're concerned about as well. Um, because you're right, you shouldn't have to lose as young people um, a teacher or a counselor. Um, because, you know, from your vantage point, particularly as seniors in this case, you all have established a relationship and this is somebody who clearly is helping you through. Um, so I do want you to know that you're heard, that you're heard will um, work with um, Mr. Davis to make sure that you get a meeting with um, meeting with your principal to, to kind of see what else might be able to be done that the real challenge though so that you know it's not it's not your principal it's a it's a system-wide issue with how we adjust budgets after we know how many students are are going to be in a class and not that you all should have to worry about that your focus should be on doing well in your classes contributing to your school community and getting ready to apply to college. Um, but I did want to give you a little bit of the background and let you know that we've heard you, we've heard others. I was out in schools today um, where the budget adjustment um, has resulted in, for, for some kids, for, for classes having to restart. So again, this is something that has been in place in the district for probably close to a decade that we now realize that we really need to take another look at for, for exactly the reasons that you're stating. Please. We're very concerned. I'm sorry. Uh, we're really concerned about yeah. um, all of the things you've just and said. I mean, you. it's true. It's, it's a long and complicated process. That's right. But if we could, if there was a way to get more student input, that'd be great. And I think it would make everything much better. Okay. Yeah. I hear you. Thanks so much for coming out. No, thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Cameron Yaksich. Did I say that right? You did. Thank right. you. <laughs>
to say good evening. Uh, thank you guys for meeting with me. Uh, I'm here representing uh, the seniors of Digital Harbor High School as well on the surplus problem. Uh, Digital Harbor senior leadership has consciously restricted any student visibility into the surplus process, uh, which we feel is a deni denial of our student body rights. We have discussed that the process of surplusing needs to be reviewed and changed to better suit the students' needs since we are the ones most negatively impacted by the loss of several staff members. We request that we request that a freeze to be put on all surplus actions, also for the surplus decision to be reviewed by district administration, and that the surplus decisions need to be based primarily on the factors of performance. At Digital, the surplus has greatly affected our school, specifically this year's graduating class of 2018. Our senior counselor was surplused, and we the students cannot help but feel like this was a personal action rather than a professional one due to her committed and persistent hard work. On November 2nd, 2017, students collectively heard from one another that our counselor would be surplused and students took action by peacefully standing in front of her office on the third floor and chanting. This then led to a march throughout the school hallways which, while continuing the chanting, uh, we were then transferred into the cafeteria where an assistant principal from digital sat us all down and refused to engage our concerns. The assistant principal gave us an overall statement saying that the principal would speak with us the following day. This gave us a feeling that the situation would have clarity. The next day, the principal gathered a group of six for a small meeting before uh, the meeting with the whole class in the auditorium at 10 a.m. After the students settled down, uh, the principal began speaking to the students, the whole class, uh, for a 10 to 15 minute meeting. She stated that she understood how we felt and would only take questions on counseling. She then refused to respond to our questions and left. Students left unsatisfied with the principal's non-responses stayed in the auditorium in solidarity with our counselor. Overall, we understand that we are just students and someone being surplused is inevitable. But we all agree that we feel shut out and not involved in this process, and the repercussions of that make it, makes it hard for us to have faith in Digital Harbor High School leadership. Once again, we respect a freeze to be put. We request a freeze to be put on all surplus actions, also for the surplus decisions to be reviewed by the district administration, and that the surplus decisions are based primarily on factors of performance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Dr. Suplaz has already talked about the, the surplus, but I just want to, one remark you made is you're just students. You are not just students. You are our primary number one customers, and so whatever you have to say is important to us and should be to the school as well. So please don't ever feel like you are just students. That phrase really hurt my heart because we're all here for you guys, and we serve you. Um, so please understand that, that this board should feel the same way. So right, thank you. That's right, and accountable to you. That's right. Thank you very much. Appreciate the clarity of your request, too. And uh, just speaking on behalf of the board, that's uh, as our primary customer, we, we have a higher expectation for how you should be heard. Thank you. <coughs> Next, we'd like to welcome uh, Jocelyn Providence. Good evening, everyone. Um, so now that we've heard student reflections on the effect of surplusing school budget decisions and budget cuts and how it's necessary to have throughout the district a transparent, open, and community-driven process, including students, like you said, there are um, the other reason why we're here. Um, I would like to talk to you about like a fundamental issue, kind of zooming out a little bit of all of this, and that's the lack of school counselors district-wide. So, but before I get into the specifics, I'm a math teacher, so let's think about a very important ratio, 250 to 1. This is the maximum ratio of students to counselor recommended by the American School Counselor Association. Thinking back at my own high school experience, I had the privilege to attend a private school, and I remember being in a graduating class of 67, and all of us, thankfully, were college bound, and we complained that our counselor wasn't giving us enough attention with just 67 of us. So I think the 200 to 50, 250 to one ratio was still a little too high. But this being an 82,000 
student school district, this means that we should have, my calculations, about 328 school counselors in the whole school district. How is this compared to what we actually have? From what I know, there are only about 85 school counselors. Let's just, let's just think about that, that inequality, 85. We should be around 328. So, I know that there are, so, blah, blah, blah. All right. <laughs> so, and I also know that based on last year's budget recommendation, the, recommend, the recommended ratio was 600 to 1, which is still above what the American School Counselor Association says. Um, and right now, if we only have 82, that's about 1,000 to 1. So we're not even meeting what our budget recommendation was. So I believe that the only way to truly meet this focus that the district has on student wholeness and college and career readiness is for resources to be allocated for school counselors district-wide and putting our money where our mouth is, just like, this, just like the district did with universal pre-K, really prioritizing that. And I believe that school counselors should be a locked position that the district funds, similar to school psychologists and similar to social workers. <laughs> Um, counselors need to be a permanent year-long position in every school, um, in every single school at the recommended amount or better than that. Because we know that our students need way more than college and career readiness. They need a lot of support at home and of the wraparound services. And so my ask is, is that you as a school board to make school counselors a locked position funded by the district like school psychologists and social workers and English language supports. We need to be all in with our high school students and middle school students the same we are with enrolling our pre-K students. So that's it. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you for your clarity. Next guest is Unique Chisholm. I'm Unique Chisholm from Baltimore Algebra Project. I'm a youth organizer. Um, my name is Jonathan Gray. I'm with the Baltimore. I'm also with the Baltimore Algebra Project. Go to Baltimore City College. Um, today I'm representing the Baltimore Algebra Project. The Baltimore Algebra Project is a youth-run organization group that focuses on uh, the education for young people in our city and eventually globally. Um, we currently do activist work in a couple schools: uh, Polly, um, Douglas, and um, other schools. Uh, the point of the Baltimore Algebra Project is to, like, you know, as I said, like specialize and better the education for our students. Um, today, where Today we're gonna. Uh, today we're like requesting um, work for the uh, school police report card. We are partners. We are partnering with Yard. Like we're um, with Yard doing a but the school police report card. We're working on getting focus groups um, of us, like the students, the youth, to talk to the students and schools about the school police report school police report cards and like the purpose of it and like why is it important and their opinion about it. That's that's all though. So um, when the Youth as Resources young people spoke, they talked about uh, wanting to have a meeting, and um, our chief of staff said that they're trying to set that up. Is that a meeting that you'll be part of, or are you requesting a separate? No, we'll be a part of that meeting also. So that'll all be in the same? I just wanted to, I just wanted to check. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's right. And then I also just wanted to let the public know that about the upcoming dates. On, so you, we're talking about slightly two different things. You're talking about the school police report card and then the comment before was about the school police policy. We want engagement on both, but I'm just clarifying that um, on the policy, I know that we're trying to set up a meeting to talk about that and, and hope to engage folks around that. On the policy, there's also a forum coming up on um, January 16th is the board forum to get input on that. Um, and then it's also scheduled to go to the policy committee on February 20th, just seeing the update, upcoming dates on that. Okay, thank you. Good, thanks. I'm, it's, I'm glad to see that rolling and that everybody's in this together. Thank you. Our next guest is Ulysses Archie. 
Hello. Hi, my name is Ulysses Archie, um, and I wanted to, to say thank you guys for uh, having this meeting and having public comments, and I wanted to also say uh, thanks to everyone here for the work that you do uh, for our kids in Baltimore City. Um, I uh, have been screening a movie called Resilience, uh, and Resilience is a movie about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And I believe that's what the kids are talking about. It's an adverse experience to have a counselor taken away. Um, and I think a lot of kids in Baltimore are experiencing these uh, type of adversities, not only at home, but it sounds like they're experiencing them at school as well. And so what I'm offering today is an opportunity to screen the film. Um, I would like to screen the film about these adversities, adverse childhood experiences, um, with, uh, I've already done it at two schools in the Baltimore City Public School System, and we'll be having a public screening on January 12th at a Roots and Branches School at 6 p.m. And so I'm interested in uh, how we mitigate uh, the trauma that the kids are experiencing and having them ready to be able to learn at, at school. Uh, some schools are doing a great job at it, uh, but we are experiencing at Roots and Branches um, a, the same thing that everybody else is experiencing, some budget uh, issues. Uh, Justin, I wanted to thank Justin for the work that he's doing because he is attacking it from a brain science perspective. You have to get the whole body engaged in learning, as I saw in the video, uh, and this brain science is you know, if your flight, fright, or freeze mode is turned on, you can't get anything in. You're about to fight, or you're about to flee, <laughs> or you're going to freeze. So you can't learn anything. Uh, so I think this movie is very, very important, and I think it is um, something that all educators should see, uh, at least as a um, awareness that this is going on. I myself was attacked by my student. I worked at a private school. Uh, I was attacked by a student and it's taken me eight years to recover from that attack. So I know what it is to be, to have adversity and I know what it is to have to deal with that on a daily basis. Uh, and so um, I'm inviting the school board to come and to share in this film with the community on January 12th at uh, Roots and Branches School. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, yes, Commissioner High Cover. Actually, AJ, can you just make sure that's on our calendar so we can pay attention to it? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and I have one last thing. I wanted to also um, see if you guys could reconsider the transportation issue for the elementary school kids um, because. Uh, uh, in December of 2016, the transportation was eliminated for the elementary school kids, and that gave me a bill of $320 per month of getting on the bus and taking my three children to school. If it had not been for a neighbor uh, allowing me to borrow his car during the day, that would be my bill. And so that kind of shifted the responsibility to parents uh, to pay for that because uh, charter schools um, elementary schools in particular are not, do not have educational support, I mean um, transportation support. Thank you. Could somebody from the administration re clarify what the, what the issue is that he's talking about? Taking transportation. Allison, do you know what he's talking about? The S-PASS, uh, S-PASS was discontinued in December for all elementary schools. In last year. Yeah, and, and and it, it greatly impacted my ability to get my kids to school. That was last year. Um, so the S-Pass was reintroduced as a municipal pass for middle school and high school students, but elementary school students were not included in that. It's on your website. Yeah. So, I mean, this year we're getting transportation for free, so I'm not sure if that, I'm, I just would need to follow up with transportation to find out. Yeah, it's for free for middle and high school students because of the municipal ID. Uh, and that was a Brandon Scott thing, and that was a whole well, system Well, that was part thing. of the package of funding that we got this year. Mm -hmm. um, 
that we that the MTA is providing transportation for free, but I'm not aware of the um, elementary different. elementary or specifically elementary schools. All elementary schools were eliminated from the S pass, um, and it made it very difficult for us to get to school. Can we follow up with that offline? I, I think in, when we do, if you if that could be clarified for the board as well, because clearly we're not we're not entirely clear. I mean, we remember all the changes, and it, it wasn't a Brandon Scott, yeah. Councilman mm -hmm. Scott thing. It was included in the overall negotiations with the state yeah. and the city. Sure. So a lot of people came together for that, but this this twist to it, we're not we're not clear. Yeah, I mean, because it's on a parent level, right? I mean, that, we, we had to deal with it from yeah, that no, level. Yeah, that's fair, and, mm -hmm. and so I think um, uh, Chief of Staff Perkins Cohen can have somebody follow up with you, and then if yeah. you can cycle back with us. To that would be great, as well. and uh, um, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Our next guest is Kim Truhart. Good evening. Three minutes is not enough. I got about 10 minutes worth of stuff tonight. This morning, um, I attended um, as a member of the University of Maryland Family Informed Trauma Treatment Center Advisory Board, um, a, a two-hour conversation around the work that the FIT Center is doing out of the University of Maryland. And I'm proud to say that Liberty is um, piloting a peer-to-peer -peer coaching trauma session with our parents on Wednesday evening. Tomorrow night will be our seventh one, and I am proud of our investment in our parents. And if you haven't heard, I'm all about investing in our parents this school year. Thanks to Teachers Democracy Project, I have about $20,000 that I'm investing in parents at three schools, Liberty, Leith Walk, and Alexander Hamilton. And the whole idea is to give parents every darn thing I can possibly give them to make them more engaged, more powerful, more knowledgeable, okay? Every month I will be introducing to them some person who's got something to offer them to make them more powerful, more engaged, more involved. I'm going to end up with parents who know so much about what y'all do or don't do right? They're going to show up, okay? They're going to stand up. They're going to be present when they need to be present. They're going to be able to advocate for their children in a, a really, really different way. So y'all got that? Don't be scared because they're coming at you, right? All right. I have no idea that you had a Twitter account, okay? I, I got that. Twitter. All right. True heart for life here on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, homeless students. Um, I told y'all before that I was looking at a definition for concentrated poverty, yeah. right? And that definition includes our homeless kids, 2,600 some odd kids enrolled in Baltimore City Schools, 1,800 children in foster care. I, this morning I sat next to the woman who heads the state um, Department of Human Services um, for children, which was very fortunate. And so she shared some great info with me. Um, we got to do better, right? This, this thing with Kerwin, if y'all haven't included it in your advocacy list, we want Thornton fully funded out of this session. Since we don't have Kerwin, right, what they can do is fully fund Thornton. Period. Right. End of discussion. And we need to show up in mass to make sure they understand that. Fully fun Thornton. Okay? Um, last point, and I'm sorry, I, I've gone over, is I'm here and we're making some of the same mistakes around school closures and conversations or lack thereof with parents um, that we had with Langston Hughes happening with Pender Hughes, possibly. And so that troubles me. Um, I'll say no more because I don't have any more facts around that. But if we're not talking to parents, right, shame on us. Um, last point is I love our children who just came here this evening. 
I think that is awesome. And if y'all don't get that you have to become accountable to those children, right? Y'all need to go. I haven't said this in a while, but y'all going to have to get, like, gone if, if that's not what you think you should be doing. Accountability, not to, you know, some politician. If you're not accountable to these babies, they, God, that, that young man needed help. It's our job to help him. And we are failing our children. And so w the course correction here is give the boy an answer. Answer his question. What are we going to do to ensure there are counselors available in the quantity that can deliver great counseling to our children every day? Every day. Because you're failing them now. And if you can't do it at the school level, then do it centrally. Thanks, Kim. Our final guest is Keisha Goodwin. Good evening. My name is Keisha Goodwin, and I am the PTO Vice President at Leithwalk Elementary Middle School. And I'm here to talk about inequity. Testing. A group of about 30-something schools can waive district testing. The other 150-something takes orders from the principal, and the principal takes orders from the network league. These orders become final decisions. Where is the democratic process engaging families, communities, teachers, and students in school decision, such as whether or not to complete an optional test? I have a couple of documents of district testing from pre-K to 12th grade, and I also have a document from the family handbook that only lists the part testing PSAT and the SATs that I would like to hand in to be put on the docs. Thank you. This test from pre-K to 12th grade comes from a list of tests as of March to April of 2017. The park is only administered by seven states. At its peak, it was 20 to 25 states. This says a lot. Our school district and schools have the right, right to create its own assessments according to ESSA. Let's do that. Schools have the right to create their own <coughs> midterms and finals. Let's do that. Could you please email principals, school family council chair, Title I, parents groups, the process in which we need to complete the paperwork to have the opportunity in order to do that. I haven't seen it anywhere. I don't know the process. The second thing I would like to talk about is the deficit. LeafWalk has lost anywhere from 10 to 15 staff members. This year they lost more staff members because they did not meet the targeted enrollment. This greatly impacted our ESOL students and our special ed students. Our ESOL and special ed students are in the largest classes. We know that they need to be in smaller classes. We lost our educator, the only one that speaks Spanish. So now our targeted one instructors cannot help 
the speaking the Spanish speaking students only or the French students and neither can the Esau teacher who speaks English we are guaranteed an efficient Keisha, and thorough to, education you have to wrap up mm -hmm. we also know that special ed and Esau students are the highest risk population so why aren't we providing them with their needs and I'll stop there any questions thanks Keisha Thank We're now going to return to the procurement items. Um, essentially, everything was pulled tonight. So um, we'll start with a presentation um, on the Fairmount Harford building proposal for the 21st century schools. Good evening, Chairwoman Kashani, Vice Chair Canham, and uh, Dr. Sandalisis. The 21st Century Office and the Facilities Education Planning are here to present the Fairmont Hartford Building, Design, Build, Procurement, and Enhanced, procurement, uh, enhanced uh, Approval Package, the EAP for your vote tonight. This school has been placed on the procurement calendar because unlike all of the other school projects in the 21st century portfolio, Fairmont Hartford will be delivered by the Maryland Stadium Authority using an accelerated process that requires the commencement of construction prior to the completion of final design. An exhaustive feasibility study was conducted during 2016, providing the information needed for MSA to procure part one of the design build scope, which produced the EAP we will review tonight. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Mignon Anthony, Executive Director for 21st Century, and with me is uh, Cindy Smith, the um, Director for Facilities, and Jeff Parker, who everybody knows. <laughs> the independent estimate of $52,235,466 represents the all-in ceiling budget for MSA to have approved the MOU um, by the MOU Executive Committee and the Board of Public Works in moving forward with Part 2 of the design-build contract and the delivery of Fairmont Hartford by September 2019. And then surplusing the Lake Clifton High School building, the largest school in city schools portfolio, back to the city of Baltimore and saving, offsetting about a million dollars a year in maintenance costs. The REACH school will move the Lake Clifton into um, the REACH school will move from Lake Clifton into the Fairmont Hartford building, which used to be known as Clifton Park High School. It is located at 2555 Hartford Road. Um, we've given you a, a site map in front of you that's a little, that gives you a broader view of the um, entire park. The one that's in your package focuses on the Fairmont Hartford building, so the one that we um, uh, we'll post later has the entire park. It shows you the relationship of the school to the Lake Clifton building. Because I, I was confused when I looked at the maps. Yes. This, this, is, this is very helpful. <laughs> exactly. The project includes three building additions, two entry areas and a gym, and a complete building renovation that aspires to 21st century learning environments for grades 9 through 12. In addition to reshaping the interior spaces, other main goals of the project as listed in the EAP will be to restore the original beauty of this building, to create distinct entries for the school and for the community. We're actually going to move the entrance of the building um, lengthwise. Uh, 
um, and to create the distinct entries for the school and one for the community and to very importantly engage the building with the park. Our continuing collaborations with a very active uh, Coldstream Homestead Montebello community and with our city agency partners, um, the Department of Recreation and Parks, Department of Transportation, Department of Public Works and Fire Services is almost legendary in that each entity is actually satisfied and complementary of this design approach. The Fairmount Hartford let's, Project. Let's let that will... sink in for a minute. <laughs> okay. That is not where we started with Lake Clifton. That's right. Matter of fact, my first visit to this room, there were people lying on the floor. And I'm sure Mark Washington was here. Yes. Anyway, I'm sorry, I just felt he like we is all in. because this is a long, I think it's worth appreciating what it's taken this team to get to this presentation, so. A lot of hard work by um, Nicole and by the, the engagement uh, office and um, Rec and Parks recently, we've, we've got, uh, gotten everybody, you know, really fully on, on, on board. So we're very happy about that. The Fairmount Hartford and, and our project manager, uh, Charlie, <laughs> from Maryland Stadium Authority um, uh, has been really instrumental in helping to push this through. He's just the person for this project. The Fairmount Hartford project will include demolition and abatement, an addition of an elevator, updating the utilities and the life safety, mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems, and interior retention, uh, interior reconfiguration. The proposed exterior improvements include an accessible pathway, biorretention stormwater management ponds, and a new campus loop, uh, landscape, hardscape improvements, a parking lot that will also support um, this, it says developed by others, uh, athletic field to the south is a proposed athletic field by um, the uh, um, Department of Recreation and Parks, which they have funded and is in their plan. So our parking will also support the use of that in, in after school hours. Uh, Cindy Smith will um, now go around the, around the inside of it. This proposed rendering shows the new entry of the building, both the um, entry on the right, the main entry, and on the left, the entry by, for the uh, community. We're retaining the old auditorium, or at least the first floor of it, uh, for community use, and extending the extension on the end has the gym. Cindy? Uh, we'd have a question before we go forward. Commissioner uh, yes. Cannon? Are we adding to the footprint, or are we working within the existing footprint? We're adding the gym to the footprint. Okay. So this actual uh, building, this actual uh, layout right here to the right shows the uh, gym addition. And then the, the total number of students it could handle? 870. So that leads me into my part. It's being designed for 870 students. Um, primarily the building is staying within its footprint, um, all the classrooms. Uh, with the gym addition, the existing building um, has two very small gyms that are not high school sized, um, a very beautiful auditorium, and is an undesignated historic significant building. So it's, we really can't do much with the ex outside other than the restore it. So um, we are adding on a gym that becomes a high school sized gym. Um, the program is a 9 to 12 comprehensive high school with several CTE programs. Uh, it will have um, HVAC and carpentry, which will be on the lowest level then um, to be able to maintain, uh, get materials in. Um, we'll also be putting in the wrestling room and locker rooms to support the gym on the lowest level. As you go up, um, the existing dining room is actually on the third floor of the building, which would really um, separate those community use spaces. So we're bringing the cafeteria and the dining room down um, with the kitchen down to the first floor, along with <laughs> keeping the auditorium. Um, putting all of the offices down there, and the program also contains an ROTC program, so those spaces will also be on the first floor. As we go up, the media center is directly above the dining room, um, so you'll have that community use kind of wing on the end of the building. It will have um, some additional CTE programs, Homeland Security, uh, some pharmacy labs. It has a significant health sciences CTE program, so those will be on the second floor. Uh, and then some collaboration spaces, and then we'll be um, using the um, 
the balcony of the auditorium for actually a new dance studio for the school. And then as we get to the top floor, that's actually where you get most of the general education classrooms, um, right-sizing the science labs so that we have um, sufficiently sized high school science labs. And it also contains a uh, citywide life skills program, and those classrooms will also be on the third floor. Um, through this all, we're um, improving all those classroom sizes and adjacencies to make sure all that those programs all flow together the way that they should. So we're open for any questions. So I've, I have a couple. Um, it strikes me that, uh, I mean, it's, you said it's an undesignated historic building. Does that mean we, we, I mean, I'm glad we're preserving it, but does that mean we don't have to preserve it because it's undesignated? What does that mean? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it, it is not officially, it has not been officially designated um, by Historic Preservation as a historic building. It's interesting that they would miss one because they're all yeah. over that stuff. But um, to save a lot of money, we will be reusing a lot of things. So that's part of, um, and the, the design and construction team for this building is the, are the same team that did the Green Street Academy. So we're very fortunate to have people who know how to do that. Yeah, it's a gorgeous building, so I'm glad we're preserving it. I just was. It's curious that it's an undesignated. Um, it's interesting with the CTE programs that are there um, that we've got a building that will have a capacity of 870, but when you look at uh, in the other attachments to in, in our documents, um, our projections as you go out in the out years are in the mid-500s. You know, they're 546, 552. It's some how people can project to that significant digit that's a little odd, but whatever, mid-500s. Um, it, it just seems like, given that the, the this is more of a comment and, and a question, I, carpentry, HVAC, homeland security, these are things that we should be really st striving to have hum so well that there is a demand for that. Um, we want the kids that go into those programs certainly to have the uh, desire, the um, if they choose to go to college, could go to college, but it would also be nice to see the quality of these programs be such that if you go through them, you really have a choice to go to college or to come out with a certificate that lets you work in these other fields because it's, it, we can hold literally 300 more students in here. So I, I'm really hoping that, I mean, this all works on spreadsheets and architectural drawings, so I, I don't have any questions about what you're trying to do, and I hope it works to do it in a design build mode, get the rationale, but I really hope that the academic side of the house from the CTE side can really start to make some of these CTE programs hum, because we shouldn't have uh, unused 300 seats when what you should get out of these programs are certifications to work in fields where there's demand, like demand. So again, I, it's not a question, it's just... We want to fill these schools. We hope we're going to build it and they will come. You know, it's and like if the academic quality is there, people will. But we're going to have to really up our game on this CTE stuff. Yep. Commissioner Chinia and Commissioner Hassan. Uh, my, and my question is in line with the CTE. Given, given the proximity to another large yeah, CTE school, right um, uh, to what extent are we doing some coordination um, in terms of programming? Because we're not too far from, from Mervo. Oh. Is there somebody on the academic yeah. side who can handle that? Is an academics person, really. <laughs> Guess we'll have to get back to yeah. you. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a. It's, yeah, here we go. Oh. It's probably different programs. I'm guessing. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Jessica Wilson. I'm the director of strategy and compliance in the uh, chief academic offices. The <clears throat> question is a good one. <clears throat> one of the things that we look at uh, is whether or not programs have entrance criteria or they don't have entrance criteria. So we definitely look at whether or not we're duplicating programs and seats across the district, but we also consider um, any of the entrance criteria pieces of that. And so Mervo is an entrance cri criteria school. Uh, this is not. And so this gives an, an additional opportunity to students who maybe didn't get into Mervo through that process that also want to go after uh, HVAC certification or a carpentry cr certification, as an example. Commissioner Hassan? 
My final question, it, I'm going to acknowledge this is something I, I just can't remember. Um, the, in, again, reading through a lot of the other documents, it's a traditional school. Reach, wasn't Reach originally a charter school with Civic Works as an operator? You have to go to the... I can't remember. That's why I'm asking. It's, Sorry. Um, Reach is not a traditional school. It's a transformation school. It does have an outside operator. Civic Works is still the operator of the school. So in these documents, somewhere in the bowels of these documents that I read most of, it says that it's a traditional school. So given the... Unless I misread it, but I, it would, I think we need to make sure we, get, we characterize that right because there is a difference. Because some of the CTE stuff makes sense when you think about um, the operator brings a lot to the table there, and it, it's not insignificant. Will do. Any other questions? Hmm? No, I think we're done. So I'd like to have a motion to approve um, the enhanced approval package for Fairmont, Fairmont Harford Building. Do I have a motion? Ma'am, it's a two-part motion to approve the enhanced approval package and the alternative delivery <laughs> method process. Is it possible to do it all as one motion? Which yes, ma'am. It's one motion, but you only mentioned the one. That's why. I just didn't want to reread the whole thing. Can I have a motion to approve the enhanced approval package and the design-build process through Maryland Stadium Authority? Approval. Commissioner Frank moves. Second. Second by Commissioner High Cupboard. All in favor? Commissioner Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, Canham, Kashani, Chinia, Frank, Bondima, and Pena. Uh, nine approve, uh, one absent. Commissioner Cooper was not here for the vote. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. It's really nice to see this come to this point after the way we started. Great job. So we now have the um, 11, 12 items. I'm not sure who we're addressing at that front. Are you going to? I think it would be easier. So that way everybody can see your face. So there were a number of people who had questions. Um, I, you had a, Commissioner Canham, Commissioner Frank, Commissioner Kashani, and Commissioner Hassan. So we're going to start with Commissioner Frank, excuse me, Commissioner Canham, then we're going to go to Commissioner Hassan, Commissioner Frank, and then I'll, if there's any left that haven't been asked, I'll go. Uh, I think the first macro question is how does this all fit? You know, and how does it fit with our how is this strategic and how does it fit with how we think about professional development as well as alignment to the blueprint? So if you could start there before going over individually, I think the questions will keep coming from there. Um, th thank you for, um, first of all, all the questions are really appropriate and they make us think, it makes me reflect on how not only we're doing the work, but how we're communicating the work. So I do think that's an appropriate place for us to start right there is this alignment to the blueprint. So as the turnaround strategy was being created, um, we really, when we were looking at research and thinking about the buckets of work that we were going to focus on, you'll see a direct alignment to the blueprint. So we looked at leadership teams, specifically how we, in these priority schools, how are we going to develop the ILTs, perfect, build professional learning communities, and think about um, impl implementing uh, consistent collaborative plannings in each of, the, of these priority schools. We also then focused on or thinking about uh, literacy, specifically with our cycles of professional learning thinking about how we're going to sub provide additional support or the core support to our schools around literacy and the cycle of professional learning that happen in our leadership sessions, and also how we're going to take have each school identify a literacy lead and how we're going to also continue to improve or develop that literacy lead at each school. And the third bucket that is our core around this turnaround strategy is looking at student wholeness and implementing or improving the culture and climate in each of our schools and once again identifying climate leads in each of the school and then how do we provide additional support and develop them. So when we look at those 
three core buckets in this strategy a very direct alignment to the blueprint. Um, the blueprint was first announced back in December, January, and that this was created in the spring. So we knew what our target was as we were trying to support our schools. Um, Say that again, the timing. When Dr. Santalisa, you announced the blueprint, the first three buckets, it wasn't like December 2016, January 2017, right January. after that. And then in the spring, after the winter and in the spring is when we are building all of this. So we are building it with the components, student wholeness, okay. leadership, and literacy in mind as we're building that. Um, Sean, ask, answer the question, why then, so I, why eight literacy leadership providers, seven leaders, lead, literacy, okay. like, like I, I don't understand, like I get, that's great to know that those are buckets that we have to focus on, but I don't understand the whole variability yeah. piece. So I wanted to start there. Th I, I okay, wanted to start there start. just Sorry, to make sure I, I went to back to the core of the strategy first. So it's almost like this all piece. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the funding from the state and using priority dollars, those are the dollars that we took off the top. We did not give those dollars to the schools. We funded support for those three areas and those activities first. And then what happened next was after the, each school had a small discretionary amount of money. Um, I can't speak to exactly how much at each of the schools because it did vary by enrollment. And then so we went through a uh, PQS process and we reached out or we created this, um, allowed vendors to apply and look at, well, am I able to support in these areas of leadership, literacy, as well as student wholeness. And through that PQS process, these 12 vendors came, uh, made it through the process for like a pre-approval. So if I'm a school now and I have a, this small discretionary fund and I want to now go deeper, I work with my uh, ILED, my principal supervisor, we cr every school is responsible for doing a needs assessment. And I say, these are some areas that I want to go deeper in, these are some areas that my needs assessment says I need to improve in. Um, working with my ILED, I start to identify that. Uh, so let's say, for example, School X says, I want to go deeper in student, student wholeness, right? And so when we look at these vendors that came through the PQS process, I, I see here that we have about uh, five vendors made it through this process. So if I am the school and I'm working with my ILED, I would say, okay, what am I really trying to get better at? And we could, uh, we could choose a vendor that says, you know, I am really good at building peer-to-peer -peer mentoring or adult-to-student mentoring. Or another vendor may say, I am really good at uh, coaching and feedback around building the cultural proficiency of the adults in my building. So they, it gave you a pool of people to choose from. It's not that saying that we're going to use all 12 of these vendors, but working schools based on the needs assessment and working with their LED, self-assessment, self-reflecting, where do I want to go deeper in? Also, for example, let's take literacy, for example, or, or let's take leadership, for example. Say I'm a school and um, based on feedback from my LED from prior years, I really want to get better at uh, going into classrooms and uh, observing and providing feedback to my teachers. Um, or is there a vendor here that would support me in going deeper in that? Um, or is there a vendor who would say, you know what, or I think that I want to work on my instructional leadership team. I want to go deeper in thinking that that's the core of the school improvement. Well, how do I align um, and identify extra support around that using my additional discretionary dollars? Just one, I know there's a lot of questions. One clarification, these are all for priority schools? Yes. All of these vendors, um, we're thinking of these interventions that are at our 20 or so priority schools. Yes, everything that we're talking about now is through the priority schools. So when we look at some of the readings, I, 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 I saw they were for them, but I didn't think they were all for them. So one of the potential confusion points on that would be there are 12 vendors here, and we are talking specifically about a PQS process for the priority schools. However, there are four vendors that are already working in the district who came through a previous process. And then there's also another two vendors who have worked with the district in the very recent past. But this piece here was specifically about how do I go deeper um, with leadership, student wholeness, or literacy. That's what these vendors were identified for. 
and schools would make the final decision work again working with their instructional leadership teams and their ILEDs. So this entire professional development expense across all these vendors is only for 20 schools? Priority schools, yes. And mind you, the discretionary funds for that they are choosing from is not a huge amount of dollars. I would say anywhere a school may have $100,000, a school may have... I think around the maximum is about $200,000 so at the most. Potentially, um, the PQS process, when a school, and I'm thinking um, when a vendor say, I'm going to make the numbers up, say they get approved for $500,000, that does not mean that they're going to do $500,000 worth of work in our district. It's just that would be the maximum if, say, every single school was interested in them because they are they have a proven track record the word is out that they're really good it just is the maximum amount that is not necessarily the amount of money that would get spent on each one commissioner hassan um so a couple of things one to circle back with the comment that you made i want to make sure that i'm clear on it with the ILEDs accessing this information to help improve their effectiveness. How does that interface with the SAM system that we just recently procured and brought online? It's called SAM, isn't it? The I know. Protocol they're using? I mean, SAMS is a, is a bit of a different process. So SAMS is a process by which um, instructional leadership executive directors, our ILEDs, as well as principals who are engaged in that process start to track their time and identify how they're meaningfully engaging with their principals um, and how principals are then managing their time and engaging um, in actions in their schools. So I just a clarifying question of the overlay here. You're asking how it's, folks it's, will it's, use it's, SAMs in order to... Well, what Mr. Connolly said was that this was going to be a metric used to help improve performance and effectiveness of ILEDs, which is the same purpose no. as SAM, yes? No. I, I, if, if I did not, if I said that that's not what I meant, I said that what I thought I was saying, or let me clarify, is when a school is going to make a decision of going deeper in leadership, right, and we're going to look at the different vendors, a school leader should be in conversations with their ILED around what it is this I as a principal need to improve okay. in, and then let's talk about where is the best way or, or where do we go to get the best support to go deeper in the leadership work. Okay. Thank you. Um, then the, the second question, which was my original first question, is um, communication is an issue in, in an organization this large. How with the multiple vendors are we able to centrally ensure a common message around wholeness or around literacy so that they're not each priority school is not doing something different from yeah. the others that can't benefit. Yeah, from and energy. I think that's what we try to do when we identify these three buckets here, leadership, literacy, and student wholeness. Um, but it is, again, through the school need assessment and the work with the ILED around where, what do you want to do, where do you want to approve. And the thought was once we identify that and you can put that in your plan as approved by the state, then we would allow the schools then to actually vet um, another vet or interview process with potential vendors to say, do I think that you are the right vendor to say, I really want to go deeper with this peer-to-peer -peer mentoring? And if that's a good fit, then we would engage in the work with you. So what's the rationale for the 12 vendors versus three? Um, I would say school choice and voice and then potentially creating more competition as somebody is really good at their work, the word would get out. Um, I think that we have to do a better job, as you've always, Commissioner Cam, you've always said in the, in the teaching and learning committees, what is our measures of effectiveness? And I think that we're really just starting that work now to ensure. So we have MSDE monitoring, and we also have MSD working with the district as well. And we are always talking about where we are in the pro, uh, progress, progressing through, uh, improving through our plans or with, uh, with regards to our plans. And a part of that conversation is, are we effectively spending our money in a way that's going to get us the bang for our buck? Um, so I think that that's something that we are really just starting to talk about and we need to get better at, but it is something that we are talking about. So to follow up on that point then, um, if we don't have this data, and I think Commissioner Bondima would agree with me, having so many variables is really hard to get information on what is and what isn't effective. Why not go with less vendor options so we can control for more of variables to determine is this in fact effective or not? And the PQS process did did sift through a lot more vendors that applied to vendors that were 
through the process, we felt like we're going to meet our needs. Okay. Um, I still I still have concerns about communication and things. Um, my last question is just to make sure that we are dotting I's and crossing T's to make sure we don't end up in the situation that our, our neighbors are in, um, is to ensure that no one on the team was compensated at all for listening to vendors. Yeah, no, it, it came up today. I have not, no one on my team has either. Okay, perfect. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Commissioner, uh, uh, CEO has some comment before we go to the next set of questions. Yeah, I was, I was just going to insert, but I, I want to make sure that the commissioners, um, remaining commissioners have time to weigh in. That's fine. We have time. Okay. You're good. Um, a couple of things. Uh, one, I do think the point about the rationale around the multiple vendors um, is a good one. I will say, though, that when the team had to develop the plans, right, when they had to submit the plans, um, the blueprint was not at the place where it is now, right? And so the level of specificity as we have put the meat around and beginning to put the meat around the plan, I think will enable us to do a much better job at narrowing uh, moving forward. And I do think that your point's well taken in terms of how many vendors we offer up for a small set of schools. Um, I also just want to remind folks in terms of effectiveness um, that, that we toss that around a lot and unless there has been a breakthrough in the research community that no one has um, shared with me as of yet, um, actually the most difficult thing to get research around within the field of education is the impact of professional development. So while I think it's great that we strive for that, while I think that it's great that we hold ourselves to a high standard, um, again, until I, I have a pretty decent research background myself and I will just say I have yet to see um, an actual authentic empirical study, um, particularly across vendors um, that does exactly that because there's so many variables. I do think the point about quality, about impact, about school feedback and the push for us to narrow so that we're not having 15 choices um, that might not all be equal is, is a tension that we have and I know that the academic team has and that is that we have said on numerous occasions um, that we are giving some of that decision-making power um, to, to folks at the school level. And we don't always get it right what that balance is, right? Like we want folks to have quality choice and I think the team's attempt to really sift through what I remember 10 years ago was just everybody under the sun. If you put a shingle up, you could do PD in city schools, you could you know, push out whatever your curriculum was, and, and I would argue that I don't think we're totally there yet, but to recognize that it's a balancing act of reminding, res remaining responsive to schools, um, yet holding um, the quality of, of the vendors that we work with. And I, and I would say what's really interesting is we're calling them vendors here, but if you look they're throughout really um, some of these folks, they're actually partners. partners. They're actually people yes. that we've worked with that we co-develop, um, and it's not just kind of plucking something off the shelf. But that being said, I just wanted to reinforce that I thought, Commissioner Hassan, your, your point is, is spot on and one that the team will continue to reflect. Commissioner Frank? Um, I should probably know this. Are turnaround schools the same as priority schools? Yes. Okay, because the procurement was turnaround. And how many, you said there are 20 priority schools, and can you just define them again? What is a priority school? Uh, you, priority school is defined by our, our MSDE. But if Correct. So that's the... Um, Lowest 5%, uh, lowest performing 5% of schools. Um, city schools make up 87% out of those identified in the state on the whole. Uh, it's also those for graduation rates under 67% um, who also receive Title I schools, uh, Title I dollars. So it is a total of 20 schools. However, four of them are SIG 4, right, and apply to that 100% project work and are not necessarily included in that. Um, Priority and school designation. Priority schools get extra resources? Correct. And then you're adding this as another supplement on top of it, this access to these services limited to these 20 schools? It is, it is part of, of what, they, what they receive. So we've leveraged priority school dollars to invest in a core strategy, which is aligned very tightly with the blueprint. Um, and then these uh, allow schools to use discretionary portions right. of those dollars to deepen work in those three key areas. Gotcha. But yeah. And I guess the question, I have a, just the question, on how does this impact the budget? So do you encumber the full amount that was approved for each vendor or do you assume it's 
some very small subset of the amount that's actually been approved that will be spent. How do, how do we know that ultimately that the budget that was approved for 18 includes the amount of money that will be spent on this program? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So um, you do not encumber, so in a PQS situation, we don't encumber that entire amount. That is the total limit at which uh, schools, the complement of schools, would be allowed to spend. Um, so we know that our priority budgets, right, uh, what is available in those discretionary dollars don't actually like hit these ultimate, mm -hmm. ultimate caps, right? So you may have vendors who have $600,000 worth of services. The dollars that we have available won't, won't get us there. They're not intended to. They're allow, um, we put a cap on that so that folks can purchase what is needed mm -hmm. based on their needs assessment and their goals as approved by MSDE. Um, so you can offer X number of services. We approve those based on alignment with evidence-based practices um, under ESSA. Uh, which was aligned with our PQS process here, but ultimately we won't necessarily hit those thresholds. Thank you. So I know Commissioner Cannon has more questions, but um, I, my question is related to Commissioner Hassan's, um, and I, I hear the answer. I just, I think I'm just going to have to reflect on this a little bit because I really, um, our, our literacy scores are abysmal, okay? Like, and I've, freaked out about that in any number of meetings for the first three and a half years I was on the board. No matter what we were talking about, I just hated that our scores were so low and that our aspirations didn't seem to push them higher. So it, it, it really rankles me. So I really buy this <coughs> blueprint thing, like that we're going to go all in. So that just seems out of sync to me with this dizzying array of X dollars per hour, Y dollars per day, Z dollars per session, 12 vendors, five components. I, I just, I'm thinking, if I'm a principal, how many sessions would I have to have with an ILED to figure out how to have my kids read better? So I, I'm, I'm, I hear you, but I, I was, I'm really, was really hoping through this blueprint, we were going to double down, and support people to teach our kids how to read better. So there might not be empirical studies to tell us how professional development is, is effective, but that's kind of unfortunate because it's, from this, I, from what I can gather, we're putting all of our eggs in the professional development of teachers to make our kids mm -hmm. read better, and so our results should be kids can read better. So I'm, that's a little bit of a disconnect for me. And there isn't anything here that supersedes the blueprint. The blueprint, no, it should be the, it, I'm the assuming this, it is helps the, to implement the blueprint. The blueprint is the core. When you think about the cycles of professional learning and how the, 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 the strategy around the blueprint around literacy, these schools will all go through this, will go through that. This, the piece around the vendors is just about a school leader who wants to go a little bit deeper and say observation and feedback a little bit deeper in developing my instructional leadership team. It will not supplant anything in the blueprint. This was designed to be directly in alignment with the blueprint, with a little bit of dollars for school leaders to work with their principal supervisor to go a little bit deeper in identified areas. So it's in addition to? Okay. Commissioner Chinia? That's what I wanted to say with you, what your, your last comment. Yeah. Um, everybody will be, the, the basic, the core is the blueprint. Everyone is going to be doing that. That's my understanding. This is like um, your choice of the, you know, from the dessert dish. And for some schools, um, if, if after the core you need extra help in one area, you have some options okay. as to where you may get that extra help and you know to go deeper in one area but this is not take away and, and again I think it, it also reminds me of what we would used to say about we still say about title one it is not to supplant it is to supplement that's very helpful so I, I, can we assume then when we're talking about the core services for the blueprint that it won't be 12 different vendors that we're going to really hone in on some things that we're going to expect schools to know how to do and do them yes, <laughs> yes really I, no that's I, what I, 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 believe, I mean I yes. I don't mean to be so simple-minded about this no. and that, that that this last exchange has really helped me because I I I it I just got out of the box I was in so that's very helpful yes. um, and I understand and, and, now. and you've experienced with the blueprint with going through uh, castle came before yeah. you all about a month ago and I believe soon 
there may be some other things that come in before you as well around the blueprint. Castle's a good example. It felt like we, 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 we made a choice and we're going to do this, not this plus this plus this plus that. Yeah, You're Castle. saying we're going to see the same thing in literacy. Well, no, 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 no. I, I, I want to be clear because the way the CASEL framework works is that there are key areas. Mm -hmm. And based on what a school says, right, they already have in place, CASEL allows them to stay within the framework and not undo all of the work that they've done in an area. So we have schools that have gone very deep in mindfulness. Matter of fact, they've been nationally recognized mm -hmm. as going deep in mindfulness, right? those schools will now not have to upend that work in mindfulness. And so you might see, right, a vendor or a partner, right, in another area like culturally responsive pedagogy that that, that, that school now has said as part of its Castle framework, right, we're ready to go deeply with. That's part of why we partnered with Castle and didn't go with, right, a, a, a very overly rigid framework because one of the things we heard loud and clear from schools is that if we've done deep work in an area already, we want a frame that's a common frame to your point, right? So that's common. Like like Commissioner Chinia was saying, right? Like that that part doesn't change. But in terms of partners who partner with us around things, right? They may vary. I do think that there's still from what I'm, you know, hearing and fully understand that, that we have to be mindful of not having an array of 50 different partners. But I also just want to say I think there's a danger in, in landing one partner mm -hmm. to do everything right. because that's how you get into monopolies. That's how you get into fat cat contracts that people can't get out of because you say you get the whole thing and we don't get to see who partners well. Now there will be some where we go, for example, around curriculum materials where it may be right a particularly large vendor, but, but I think the emphasis is that the blueprint is in place, right? But, but the blueprint provides the frame with which and in which we are answering these these decisions, but it's not going to ever be, and that's why I just, I wanted to put no, it, because I, I don't want to go on the record no, fair and I said it's going to be one vendor for for student wholeness. No, fair it's enough, not be fair one enough, and I think the board, and I'll, I'll speak personally, I just want to make sure I can keep up, right, because we're, as sure. we start to, the, the, the blueprint, we're, we're happy when it was announced, and now as we start to spend money to make it happen, whether it's the dessert tray or the main course, that I, I just want to keep up and make sure I understand it all along the way. And all I want to know, frankly, is that at the end of the day, as a result of these investments, our kids will be able to read. Yeah. And because I, right now, they can't. And that's what we're trying to get to. And that's the goal. And I think as we move forward, Peter, you're going to see less and less partners as a part of this as we find out and realize who is really good at what they're doing and who is not. Okay. Commissioner Canham? Can you just talk me through the process of, because there are a lot of choices and you want them to meet, just talk me through the choices of the ILED working with principals mm -hmm. to actually make the right match again, because I think yeah. that's an important piece. And I have a follow-up question yeah. to that. So I will go back. So when we were creating this and talking through what will this look like, um, I went to go visit I, I'm, I think it was Callaway Elementary, and the principal's name is Miguel Toro de Toro. And one of the things that I was invited there to observe was um, the work that he was doing with a partner that uh, was similar work around observation and supervision. So I followed him around, observed classrooms with them. I went to the debrief session with the teachers. I went to the debrief session with the principal, and then I met with him alone one-on-one -on -one, and just was like why are you doing this like wh what's going on what did you get from this and he talked specifically about um he had worked with his ILED and he had said that this is something i want to get better at and so they looked he looked within his school community and part of it i believe was paid for by someone else not necessarily the school and they looked for ways for him to get better at observation and feedback for his teachers because he thought that that was that strategy that was going to move the needles to improve instruction in his classroom and improve it for the teacher for students so um 
he talked to me about that was a conversation he had with his ILED, and this is what he wanted to work on to get better. So that stuck with me in the back of my mind and brought it back to my team about what are the other opportunities that principals will have to get better. But I do think it has to be in a conversation with their ILED because the ILED is their rating officer. The ILED is the person who is the first line of support for them. And if they aren't in agreement of how to go deeper with a specific in a specific area, I don't know how that would but, work. But they do, an, the, you, you said earlier, they do a needs assessment sitting with the principal. They have a plan. Then they match the, the professional development service to what their plan is. Is that a correct? There's a needs assessment for all, every priority every school, school has to go through a needs assessment, yes. OK. Um, and um, okay, I just you know I I know a little bit about principal coaching, and principal you know I've been involved. I just there there were a lot of vendors around principal coaching, people I've never even heard of, and I um, just want to make sure that that the ILED is helping them match and do all that. Um, and then just how tell me again? I've asked this question before, but the the evidence piece, like how are you going to know a year from now that uh, turnaround consulting is yeah. is 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 the one is doing great and uh, uh what systems have you put so in place to track? Like I said, we're still early in this process, but there are certain structures and systems already in place with our partnership with MSDE. Uh, there's monitoring visits. I, I don't know if they're like once a month or so where MSDE partners, and they go out into the school and they do observations. They have the school plan that they've approved and they're looking for growth in that area. There are also visits with MSDE here with district leadership and they are also looking at the strategy and are we progressing with the strategy and part of that conversation is since these are all priority dollars that are given to us from the state are we investing our money wisely and are we getting uh, the return on investment Commissioner Cooper thank you my question was actually for Commissioner Frank but um, it goes back to his budget question and I'm not sure um, your answer answered his question I think he was asking and I just confirmed with him that the amount of money that is allotted in these contracts within our budget is the entire amount included in the budget that we voted on or budgets that we will vote on. No. So here comes Mr. Parker. <laughs> <laughs> So the way this works is that uh, the financial uh, finance loads these budgets, whether it be for Title II, Title I, general funds, et cetera. And it is against those budgets that are loaded in our, into our fiscal systems that the schools actually create requisitions and contracts with these vendors. So the control mechanism is in, is in our Oracle and in our e-commerce system that actually goes down and goes against that budget and says, School A wants to spend $50,000. Do they have $50,000 in their Title II budget to spend this money? And then the other thing we do is we compare to make sure we have a contract with that vendor. And if those two things match, then we issue the contract to the vendor for $50,000. The amounts that are reflected in these agreements are just that, the agreements for those specific services. But what the schools choose is entirely up to them based on the, that sort of price list that they're provided as to which service they want to procure. And so that, that slightly answers the question. Okay. I, I'm, I'm at a broader level, right? So we, we vote on a budget that says it's $1.1 billion, wherever that may be. This contract has a maximum amount. So from a business perspective, my thinking is I have to, at a minimum, be able to cover that amount. If for whatever reason, these schools max out that amount. Now, if that's not what we do, then help me understand. So what we do, for example, there's a, one of these contracts is for up to $200,000, as an example, over the course of 12 months. So we will create a a contract purchase will create a control inside of our financial system that prevents the school system from spending over $200,000, period. That's how we control what the board tells us they, the limits are for these contracts. Okay. And then what we do is, what I said earlier, 
is the money has to be in the budget. So if the money hasn't been appropriated in the budget, then the school cannot spend the money. Correct. So there, there, there's two levels of guardrail. The first is the in the in the example that Mr. Parker gave us, there's a two hundred thousand dollar limit that is set on this contract that cuts across the system. So if as a system over 15 schools, we go over $200,000, the little alarm goes off and Jeff Parker makes people mad and tells people you can't spend anymore because we have reached the system limit. The next level down is the school level. So a school, right, may only have $5,000 within its budget to spend on this same vendor. That school can't go up to $10,000 just because the district has a district-wide approval of 200. That school spend is controlled by the budget. So there's two layers. There's a system layer and there's a school layer. The variable here that we might be missing that all of these expenses come out of the school budgets. So the, the math is adding up how much across all the schools, in this case 20 schools, have available for professional development after they pay for their teachers. That's the math, right? I mean, that's how much money has to be available. That's how much we can spend. So I have right? I mean, does that make sense? It's coming, it's not, it's not budgeted centrally. The contracts are approved, cent the, the vendors are approved centrally for up to a certain amount, but all the money comes out of the individual school budgets. Right, but it's not accurate to say it's not budgeted centrally because we approve a large one budget. So it is budgeted centrally. It's budgeted centrally, but a, it's spent, a, it's spent, it's spent through, schools, through schools. But it's budgeted centrally. But in the school budgets, they only have but so much to spend on professional development after they pay for their staff, and presumably we know what that number is. I mean, I think yes. that's the assumption. Are there any other questions? I just have one question, which just may show my ignorance, but I just want to. So we're approving, um, if we vote to, these possibilities, and then schools would have to choose them. Yeah. But just because we vote for them, if the schools don't choose them, that's right. And the, the money never gets saying. spent. That's okay. right. Okay. That's, that's right. the essence of the requirements contracts. Right. Yes. Thank you. Just, I mean, I mean, this process may mean that some of the vendors will get n will get no contracts. They've just they just indicated that they're willing to have their their company out there, but but they're not assured that they're going to get an actual contract. So we appreciate the your patience with our questions. I think we really wanted to be comfortable given the complexity of this request. I want to be f uh, I want to ask now if anybody had a question on a specific um, item. We had 10.01 through 10.12. The nature of the questions was about all 12, but I also want to create the space in case anybody had any questions about any of the 12 individually. All right, since nobody had a question on the 12 individually, what I'd like to do is to uh, ha entertain a motion to approve <laughs> items 10.01 through 10.12. So moved. Uh, motion by Commissioner High Cupboard. Second by Commissioner Chinia with a smile. Um, all in favor, uh, Commissioners Berkeley, Hassan, High Cupboard, uh, Canham, Kashani, Cooper, Chinia, Frank, and Bondima. Motion passes nine to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Commissioner High Cupboard. Thank you. Thank you. Even though we discuss these extensively in teaching and learning, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the board sort of went through this and the whole board got the same understanding that we got during teaching and learning. So we should always offer that space to the board because sometimes OPS has things that I haven't been mm -hmm. aware of. We should sort of offer that time available and give the whole board to sort of digest the information. So. No, I appreciate it too because I, through uh, three quarters of that presentation, I was carrying one understanding about how this works and it wasn't until that point, uh, a point when I actually understood it differently so uh, it sometimes it just takes a little bit of time and it's better for us to understand the contracts that we're voting on than not that's that's a yeah my light bulb went off and you knew it you were patient with me and I appreciated that so that that concludes the procurement item we're going to move now to the uh, information and discussion part of the agenda 
Uh, first item up is the uh, item 18.01, the proposed academic school calendar for school years 2018-19 and 2019-20. Commissioner Kim. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Good evening. My name is James Torrance. I'm the Staff Specialist for Strategy and Compliance in the Academics Office. Tonight I'm presenting the pro proposed academic calendars for school year 1819 and 1920 to just remind the board and the general public. 1819 was presented last year as a draft and we're bringing forth 1819 as a finalized version for next school year. And then 1920 will be the draft for the following school year. We are now aligning ourselves with the rest of the state and proposing two calendars at one time instead of a year-to-year -year calendar. Just some background, this calendar has an overview because last school year we started with the Labor Day start and the requirement to end by June 15th. Also, this was constructed in understanding our actual requirements, both to legal requirements for Comar and contractual requirements. Just to give you an idea, we build this calendar to maximize instructional time, professional development time. We also want to make sure that it makes sense for families and faiths. And also we want to make sure that we ensure that testing windows are available. Please note that right now we have not received the testing windows for next school year from MSDE yet. So they will be posted to the calendar for the final version as well. Just to give you an idea, contractually we're required to have 10 professional development days for teachers. Also, three parent-teacher conferences, inclusive of back-to-school night. <coughs> and as well, we must have five consecutive work days for spring break and also winter break. To give you an idea, we are required by state law in Comar to have 180 days or 1,080 hours, and that a school day can constitute three hours. Also, we're not allowed to open on Saturdays and Sundays and holidays. City Schools also operates a year-round school, New Song Academy, which falls under this category, which is exempt from the actual calendar matrix and how we prevent it. To give you some idea of legally required holidays, Thanksgiving and the day after Thanksgiving are legally required holidays by Comar, as well as Good Friday and then, as we say in the South, um, Easter Monday is required by um, is required by state law. And also, just to draw your attention to the primary election and general elections, for the next two school years, we're going to be faith, we're going to have issues with that because we have the general election for the state on November 6th, and then the primary election for the presidential election in, on April 23rd. So here's the proposed calendar for 2018-2019. Uh, under this framework, staff will return on August 28th for four days. That's Tuesday through Thursday, Tuesday through Friday, excuse me. School starts on September 4th. Labor Day is September 3rd. Uh, winter break will be December 24th to January 1st. Spring break will be April 16th through April 22nd. Just to remind you that we are one of the few districts that have a spring break that's more than three days. Also, school ends on June 14th. In this year, we have, to say at least, we were unlucky to have um, June 15th to fall on <laughs> a Saturday. Had it fallen on a Monday or Friday, would have had an extra school day. So to give you an idea, we're exactly at 180 days. Um, also, in for our climate weather plan, we have identified a professional development day on February 15th and then April's April 16th and 17th for spring break. Uh, under the new state Comar requirement, we must exhaust three days before we can apply for a waiver from the 180-day requirement. In terms of it, we maintain a traditional framework of our professional development days, where we have our teachers come back for four days in August, and then we have two professional development days in October. One is in November, and also we have the, 15, the traditional January, which our secondary teachers are really concerned about because in that time it allows them to catch up. That's actually when second quarter ends, around that time. And that's also transitioning for half-year courses. Also, we have the March 15th date as well. 
In terms of holidays, you denote that in the red asterisk are the legally required holidays, and then to the far right are the dates that we have for allocated for district office for closures. And also, we have identified the parent-teacher conference windows and actual dates. So we have some where we have half-day professional development, and the other day we have another portion of the day we have teacher conferences. And then we give windows for our schools to have those conferences. And next is the quarters. We have identified the 45-day increments for the quarters, and that is inclusive of our holidays, and it takes the account of all our professional developments as well. To understand the framework, we have one of the continual challenges of the calendar is with dual enrollment. Traditionally, colleges start way before Labor Day, and that will be a cost unto us if we have students participating in dual enrollment, especially for transportation. As well as, depending on when the pendulum I say where Labor Day falls, Labor Day can be anywhere between the 2nd to the 9th of September. So in that time, it may limit us in the number of days that we may have for professional development in outer years. Also, we have to go back to summer learning loss and how our students are given an extended almost between four to six to even almost two weeks of summer, depending on when the spring break falls. So that's two weeks of summer learning loss. Oh, as well as spring break has tentatively been dependent upon state waiver and how we exhaust those days. And then in terms of outreach and timeline, district office staff were able to see the calendar in September, October. Currently, we're garnering support and feedback for the calendar. And the calendar will be posted to the website for general comment. Last year, we received over 75 comments regarding the calendar and concerns about how does it fit in with the Labor Day requirement and executive orders. And then board vote next month. And then we also have the proposed calendar for 1920, which also follows a similar framework. Staff returns on the 27th. Um, schools start, school starts on September 3rd. Spring break is December 24th through January 1st. Spring break is April 6th through April 13th. Also, school ends June 15th. And then the inclement weather days, again, recovery plan weather days are February and also April 7th and 8th. Again, we do follow the 10 contractual days and maintain that framework as well. And then also the asterisk would denote, here we have the primary election on April 28th, which will happen in 1920. It will happen in school year 20. Year 20, sorry, my apologies. And again, we have the parent-teacher conferences, both the windows and the actual days that will align with pr professional development half-day half day, um, conferences. And again, we have our quarters identified for that school year as well. Questions on the proposed calendars? Commissioner High Cupboard? You may not be able to answer this, but I'm going to try anyway. We started this year with this new calendar system in place, right? Do we notice an impact on our students having to start after Labor Day? What, what Do we know anything different that's occurred as a result of this new start date or this new sort of push to get kids in after Labor Day? I do not have that answer okay. right now, but I can provide it before the vote. Maybe it's a, it's a follow-up that staff can do. I just, I'm just curious what, what yeah, impact. You don't have to answer this for now, but I'm sure. just curious what impact it has on our kids and how we're communicating that with the state about what that means for summer school, what that means for, um, <coughs> yeah. No, I and I, I think part of it is, um, again, having anecdotal feedback, mm -hmm. you know, from schools, from school leaders. I do know that um, the state board was very... Um, very supportive um, of our decision for our turnaround schools to start school earlier. Yep. And we were actually encouraged um, by many members of the state board, and it was fairly unanimous. I mean, it's one of the few places, I think, where the board fully agrees. Um, but when I went to present on our proposal, um, we had incredible amount of support from the state board um, for submitting waivers based on... Um, frankly, their understanding of why our young people in Baltimore City should be in school earlier. And so I do think it's something that as a district, we need to pursue moving on. But yeah, they, they were incredibly supportive. Initially, we thought that we might get some pushback, um, but they 
um, definitely supported us in a way that I think that we as a district um, should continue to look into how we get waivers for schools, particularly, um, you know, some of our underperforming schools. Right. And I think that that's, you know, that's one of the cases is that, you know, folks want to make cases about city schools, but then, you know, we have these other elements that undermine um, the educational um, pursuits of our kids. And the state board was very, very open to that. Yeah. My second question is just around professional development. When we do that, does that mean that we then have to pay out of our, out of our coffers? teachers additional funds to be able to come back earlier for professional development or if we want to extend PD opportunities outside of the calendar in a lot of days we're paying teachers to do that in order to get our kids what they need that's that that is true and so if it's you look at us the money to do yeah this. so so if you if you look at the four schools involved in um, the school turnaround those um, and I had a chance to attend yeah. that staff professional development with those four schools um, those teachers went away for a, almost a week together mm -hmm. they not only did team building but they did deep work in curriculum um, and they unequivocally when you talk to the teachers on the ground said that that kind of time was invaluable to them in starting now you know our challenge as a district is to make sure that we can provide those kind of opportunities, but I think what it does show is when, when you actually have the time and you can be creative about it, um, we had a, teachers overwhelmingly from those four schools um, were incredibly, um, saw that experience as being incredibly valuable. And to your point, because they were six schools and had extra dollars, they used some of those extra dollars to support that time. I'll refrain from making a smile or comment about I understand money in business people's pockets versus taking money away from our kids and our teachers. But, uh, I was just saying, I refrain from making a smart aleck comment about taking money away from our children and putting money in the hands of business folks so that we can start school later um, rather than investing in our kids and our teachers. Thank you for refraining from making that comment. <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. Commissioner Canham? Um, so this is probably the comment I get mo most about <laughs> as a commissioner, the calendar, and so many teachers are thinking about, and I think you're com the, the things that you struggle with to put this together is I really appreciate the thought that's in it, and it, it cares because, you know, there, people are making plans. How Can you just explain the rationale? Because you, you've built in, what, two inclement days or three inclement days? In three. The, three. So, you know, we could get a blizzard uh, for like, we'll be out for like five days. What's the, can you, and I think we have to be clear because I'm fielding questions this year about what would happen to spring break if we have a really tough, um, tough winter. What's the, how do we approach taking off days from the calendar? If you could just be clear because I think um, I didn't have clarity on that. I know the, the three that's on here, but then what? I will say that the state requires us to use three days before we can use a waiver. And then it's hard because it is an act of God because if there was civil unrest, we can get a waiver for it because that would be a day. It depends on when the snowstorm comes, if there's a hurricane. So to put it this way, that the way that the current structure of the calendar is, we're at a strategic disadvantage. So, okay, so then you ask for three days get used up, you ask for a waiver, the state yes, says, sorry. Then what do we do as a district? More than likely because I'm going off of what I would think from being at the state board meeting and knowing that they just changed the rule from five days to three days in September, that they're leaning towards what's best for students and what's best for us. Because right now, because of the executive order, we cannot go past June 15th, no matter what. So you think they would give the waiver? They're most likely would give the waiver? Most likely. Yeah. Emma? Yeah, thank you. I have a comment, and I'm going to say I'm very impressed with the schedule, the way you Put that schedule together. The reason why I'm impressed, I don't know if you realize that most of the colleges and universities look at your schedule to determine how they are going to plan their schedule. Because one of the most difficult things that occur, and I've said it on many meetings on scheduling, when you are out, the students at the college who has children in school, they're not in their classes. And they look at your schedule and when you don't put it out right away, they worry and they struggle in waiting for your schedule because they cannot schedule their schedule until they see what you've done. Because if they schedule their class to start school earlier before you start, that means that students do not come to school 
and they're missing, or they bring their children to school and they have new policies now where they can't bring their children to the school. So it's, it has a major effect, and I don't know if you realize that. And when school is out for snow days, students aren't in college, you know, and or they try to bring their kids to school and then they, they sit home. So, you know, what you do and the way you've done your schedule, I'm really impressed that you did it so early because they don't put theirs out that early until after you've scheduled yours. Put your Thank schedule you. In. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, James. No problem. So next we're going to have the first reader of FFA naming slash renaming a school program or facility. Should I wait or go right ahead? You're good. The, night, the night is young, right? <laughs> <laughs> Got a chuckle. That was that was good. For, <laughs> for 8 p.m., I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, my name is Heather Nolan. I'm the Director of Knowledge Management in the Office of Achievement and Accountability, and I'll be presenting the first reader of the Naming, Renaming a School Program or Facility Policy, FFA, FFA, RA. So quick overview of the policy. So the purpose of the current policy and the regulations is just to set forth as a district the uh, criteria and considerations for a school community in the naming or renaming of a school facility. Um, and it's also to provide uh, details on the involvement or the requirements for the involvement of a school community in the naming and renaming po uh, process. Uh, in the presentation, I'll, outli I'll outline in more detail the recommendations for revisions that we're making to, uh, for example, the policy standards, with one being the consideration of uh, individuals that are deceased, either in the Baltimore community, regional, or uh, national level in, in the renaming, um, as well as the consideration of what to do uh, through our school merger process, which is becoming more prevalent now as part of the 21st centuries. And then I'll go into detail around so, for example, some of the implementation strategies, which is around the program naming convention, uh, using previous names um, uh, from buildings that are now closed, and also just the being uh, thoughtful about the duplication of school facility names or program names that are similar to other already existing buildings. Uh, what the process for the FFA policy looks like uh, is that the school leader uh, provides to the CEO designee uh, a school renaming request form. This is a rec this is new to the policy that we're we're recommend recommending. Um, the request is reviewed by the designee, and it actually should read OAA, so the Office of Achievement and Accountability, not the Office of New Initiatives. Um, if the uh, viewer is going into the uh, Word documents that are currently on board docs, the Word documents are correct. It's just that this PowerPoint presentation is incorrect in identifying the designee, but the designee is OAA. Um, but OAA works in conjunction with the Office of New Initiatives, or ONI, facilities and 21st century schools in reviewing the, uh, the request. Um, we as a group make the uh, we, as a group, make the approval um, to the school leader whether to convene a naming or renaming committee. Uh, that renaming uh, committee convenes um, as a school, makes a recommendation, and then submits it to uh, city schools. And in that, and then at the end of the process, the board either approves or does not approve the recommendation. Uh, the school leader's responsibility then is. One, to con serve as the lead um, and to convene representatives from the parent group, the school family council, student, faculty, and staff. 
Uh, school leader is responsible for tabulating what the suggested names are from the community um, and developing what that recommendation is, as well as showing uh, proof that they have convened a community uh, of stakeholders and can demonstrate support for the proposed name um, and that they are present in the recommendation um, that goes to the Board of, Commis the Board of Commissioners for a vote. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is already a policy and regulation in place. However, we are coming to the board to revise that policy. Uh, one of the rationales being that per BGC, uh, at minimum, policies are to be reviewed on a staggered six-year period. Uh, FFA and FFARA were adopted in March 9, 2010, so time's up. Time to review and revise it, especially given uh, uh, the most recent changes and, again, our initiatives such as 21st Century that is really uh, uh, drawing some reflection and thinking from district office staff on how to really approach uh, naming and renaming. And then also um, FFA really covers just a school facility so that physical building, but what we wanted to make sure is that the policy and regulation expand to also encompass the uh, program name. So in many of our schools, a uh, school name is one and then their facility name is something else, um, especially with facility buildings now being uh, shared spaces across multiple schools. We want to make sure that the policy encompasses all components. Uh, over the course of last year, we assembled an FFA committee to review the current policy and regulations against uh, policies from other school districts. Uh, we collected stakeholder feedback over the summer. Uh, we also presented this uh, proposal to the policy committee September 19th. We're here today for uh, the first reader and then we'll be coming back for second reader January 9th uh, in the new year. So on to the specifics of our changes, our proposed changes. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are recommending in the FFA policy as well as in the regulations that the inclusion of school programs uh, be, uh, be mentioned. Um, also around the previously used names, a list of previously new used names uh, were retained for future considerations. Uh, now we, the, the language nuance change is that we are recommending that those uh, older names be considered versus required. Um, and that another addition that we are making more clearly in the regulations is that the duplication of school facility and program names be avoided, um, especially names that are substantially similar to what is already uh, an existing school program name. So again, not to create confusion with the community or with the U.S. Postal Service um, in, in receiving of goods. Um, the other addition that we are making is around the merger of schools um, so that, again, a new requirement has been added to consider a new name within one year of a merged program beginning. Again, thinking about the identity of this new school as they're bringing multiple communities together and just making sure that we're considering um, the multiple standpoints. And then there was language in the previous, um, in, the, in the current policy regarding a legacy plaque and um, what we want to just make a, a clarity point um, is that the cost should be assumed by the school and or community if they wish to add that legacy plaque, as that was not, um, that was not mentioned in the, the current policy. Other changes that uh, we are recommending is that the school leader now be required to convene a committee to review the recommendations. In the past, it was something that was recommended, um, and that also, for more clarity's sake, that the, there be at least one community forum and there, there be ac an actual tallying of the naming uh, and the recommendation um, to show as evidence. Um, the other update that we are making as well in the policy is that um, expanding the list of people or groups that can initiate requests. In the past, it just had been the school leader, but we're expanding that to also include either the instructional uh, leader, executive director, office of engagement, 21st century, as well as expanding that the definition of a school leader be that of a 
operator as well if it's a charter a charter school in terms of the feedback that we've collected and the uh, what um, and our response to that feedback so when we presented to the um, to PCAB uh, they were really uh, giving us feedback to make sure that our school communities are involved in the process and that they need to, the school leaders need to demonstrate that they have collected the feedback from the community at large. Uh, so as such, we have made adjustments to the policy and the regulations to, uh, to represent that. Uh, the feedback from principals um, is that they want greater guidance uh, and clarity around the policy. So in our regulations, we've outlined more clearly some of the things that brought confusion, such as how many community meetings should you have, who do I send what information to, things like that. And we'll also be building out a corresponding guide for principals to create further clarity. Uh, we uh, also gathered feedback from our charter advisory. Um, and their, their feedback was to expand the definition of school leader to include operators. Uh, and so we did that because that makes sense. Uh, so we included that in the policy and the regulations as well. Um, there was also feedback um, around uh, from the policy committee back in September, um, just in general around this concern that the CEO or designee had to approve the renaming request prior to a, uh, the school leader convening a naming and renaming committee. Uh, we reviewed that recommendation with our uh, district leadership and are making the recommendation that the regulation actually remain unchanged with the CEO designee, which is OAA, again, not ONI, uh, in consultation with a committee, uh, determining whether the naming renaming should be convened or should continue. Um, again, this is to ensure that all factors are considered prior to a school leader assembling and going through the process, uh, which is a very time intensive uh, process uh, for assembling a naming and uh, naming renaming committee. Uh, what we will continue to do is that we will, as a committee, uh, give feedback on the naming request uh, to the school leader so that they can always come back and make revisions to their naming request once they they have gotten our feedback on approval or 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 not approval. Um, and then finally, as part of our, our request form, um, there was uh, feedback on lack of instruction around a, a submission. And so we have added more to, more to the form to provide clarity on that. Um, so if approved, uh, these revisions, if approved, uh, once they are approved, then we will disseminate the information to district staff that are supporting our schools, we will also uh, share this across district offices so that they are aware, especially our partners in facilities, 21st centuries, and ONI, and that we will share this at large through our internal communications, which is our leadership action update. Questions? Commissioner yes. High Cupboard. So thank you for that. And I was in policy committee, but I still have additional questions. So um, on slide nine, this is no offense to the CEO or any of the leadership team, but um, you're waiting for the CEO to say that you can meet. The community can meet without the CEO's approval, right? So the school-based staff has to get approval in order to have meeting, but the community could meet in the community and have a discussion what they'd like to have happen, regardless of whether the CEO even knows about it or the principal knows about it or not. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that we're clear about that. Like we're not preventing anybody from having a conversation. It may not be an official conversation really mm -hmm. at the school, but we're not telling the community what they have to do or what they can't do. So I just want to be clear about that. Yes. Um, but on slide um, seven, we talk about the school leader being required now, which I want much, a nuance on that. So we're requiring the school leader, if the community or if the, a teacher or if a kid or whatever, if someone says they want to be convened, the school leader is now required to convene them. Is that what so you're this, saying? On so uh, this is. I'm gonna go back a, a slide as part of the. Sorry. So in, the, in looking at the school leader responsibilities, so they convene a committee once they've received approval uh, by the CEO designee that they can move forward with considering a new name for that uh, school program or for that facility. So the school will be required to convene at least one 
community meeting if they have received approval by the CEO designee. Okay, so let me clarify my question. LD, mm -hmm. Clearwater School, et cetera, but it still is really reliant upon staff to sort of be convinced that there should even be a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I'm just a little bit concerned that we're, allow we're allowing sort of individual principals to make a decision for a community. And so they could, they could halt the process. So what could we do to, so, so is there an appeal process? Is there a way for the community to then sort of submit to the CEO, we've made this request to the principal, the principal has to ignore our request, we'd like to be heard. I mean, there's gotta be a way, if, and I'm not trying to say that our principals are difficult, I don't mean to say mm -hmm. that at all, but there could be a situation where a principal doesn't agree with the community, mm -hmm. and as such, there should be a way, especially when these names are so important in terms of like legacy and history in our communities and whatnot, a way to sort of allow them to address either the, the chief of staff or CEO or IELD, some way of having a, a, another process. Okay. Sure. I personally like this. I'm going to bring my colleague from 21st Centuries here. Good evening. Um, Nicole Price, Director of Community and Public Relations for 21st Century. When we um, met with OAA at the start of the developing the committee, one of the suggestions or one of the reasons for adding in those other departments, the ILAD, the Office of Engagement, our office, was to also take the principal out of the, being the only one deciding whether or not a naming would go forward. The piece that I think your question is, in the current policy, the, once the principal receives approval or once the approval process begins to actually hold a renaming committee, the principal doesn't actually have to hold the committee. It now just says we have to have a committee. So I think it may be a, a matter of just That's changing the word of who orders that, who, who facilitates the. Yeah. Her, her. I got that part. My question is a principal says, no, I don't want to do this. Right. right. So if a principal says, no, I don't want to do it, there, there are other people who could do it. I think it's just a matter of changing who could facilitate. So probably the principal, the LED, the 21st century office. So in the case of like John Eager Howard, we actually facilitate a good portion of the process, although the principal was 100% in, in uh, support. We're currently doing it now for Lynnhurst and Rockdale Heights. So we're facilitating a good portion of the process so that one, the principal doesn't have to do it because they have so much going on. So I think it is a question of really who facilitates that required meeting. That's not no. my question either. I, my question really I is get, about honoring a request of a community. So if a principal is not interested in this or they don't understand how to get access to you or the IELD, because communities don't understand all that, bureaucracy, sure. right? What, what is the process by which the community, so it might be they need to appeal to the IELD and when they call the district office, the district office says you need to call the IELD if the principal's not responsive to you. To, you see what I'm saying? I want to I want a process just clearly outline as to how the community can get responsiveness if the principal isn't mm -hmm. responsive to the community's request. That's all I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Understood. Okay, Commissioner Hassan and then Commissioner Bandima. So my question is related to uh, slide seven as well. With initiating a request, is that a comprehensive list of the people um, or do we need to look at some language around recognized school organizations? PTA, could they ask? Could youth as resources, could they step up and say, you know, we want to change the name of our school or does it have to come mm -hmm. only from this exhaustive list? The intent was to be as exhaustive as possible. We did not include the PT. We hadn't include at that point the, the PTA, but that's something that we should consider. I think in all of this, and, I, and I, I get both of your points, commissioners, but I think in all of this, it's still um, acknowledging and uh, believing in the role of the school leader as the school leader at at that school and so that's I just I'm I'm reflecting on your comments that we will take back and think through how do we still remain how do we still acknowledge the role of the principal as that leader at the school but still take into consideration and viewpoints and and uh, beliefs from a school community uh, around a naming when there is a there is a disagreement or you know uh, disagreement in it. And there, there's a lot of really good reasons to have some centralized oversight on this. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest uh, looking into the possibility of recognized school organizations okay. as another, just that would, that would encompass who could bring it to the principal. They, just to be clear, they do make the request now. So for some schools, we get a request just from a, a parent in a meeting to say, will you consider this? So PTAs, community members, a number of requests come from a number of different people. Um, so they, 
There is no um, shy, they're not shy about making their request. Okay, I just want to make sure that, that it gets heard. Commissioner Bondima. We had this conversation at the policy meeting and I'm, and I'm a little bit confused and maybe you can explain to me. I thought, I understand, I thought the, um, our concern was having only one or two people make a decision about um, naming, renaming um, the school and, um, and I'm, I'm hearing a mixture of things right now. I'm, I'm, can you explain to me, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned how, how we, it sounds like it's right back where we started. Am I wrong? Mm, no. You, okay. So, th what we are, um, so what we are proposing mm -hmm. is that um, to initiate a request mm -hmm. for a school renaming or a program renaming, that the request either come from the school leader, which can be the principal or the charter operator, uh, the ILED, Office of Engagement, 21st Century, that that request goes to the CEO designee. They convene a group to review that request um, and then make a, a decision on whether that the school can move forward with convening a committee, a larger community uh, committee, to consider different names for the request process. The conversation right now with the, commi the um, our commissioners is who is the who is the initiator of the request? Does it just fall in the school leader um, or those in the district office? Or is there an opportunity for community or recognized community or school groups to initiate that request or submit that request when especially there is a disagreement between the school leader and the school community about whether the school name should be renamed or not. Mm -hmm. Commissioner High Cupboard? I, I don't want to belabor this, but I just want to clarify. Uh, what I really meant is I, I, I want the principal to be invested in this and they should convene the community conversations at the school. I want that to happen. My question is really when that's not allowed to happen, right? When mm -hmm. a principal is saying, I'm, I don't have time for this, I'm too busy, I, I don't believe the name should change, whatever, for whatever reason, I just right. want the community to have another way to access the opportunity to do so if the principal has, has said no. And there, there could be a decision that, you know what, this isn't the right time for that and that's okay, but there should be a mechanism to do that. And I appreciate, Nicole, what you're talking about. Well, you have a very organized sort of way of convening groups around the century schools and whatnot. I, I, I'm all referencing schools that are not part of our those processes and that are not in line right now to get a new building or close or change or merge, but rather other schools that are just, you know, maybe they it's a random name of a neighborhood and they'd rather put a person in the name of that school because mm -hmm. it's been a person in the neighborhood was significant that you know whatever so that's why mm -hmm. I'm saying I'm less less so the facilitated conversations and more those who have the opportunity to have that feedback opportunity yeah. and that's yeah, what some, I agree some of my recommendations actually came from my time in the engagement office not related to 21st century okay. and that's okay. what I was agreeing on that's what we talked about yeah. that the community that's where our point to have the community have an active role in the naming of the mm -hmm. um, of the school. So we appreciate your willingness, as you said, to reflect on this input. It, it sounds like it's, it doesn't sound like there's any disagreement, but it just maybe a point of it's emphasis. Language, yeah, I think yep. so. I think so. So okay. nice job. Thank, Thank you. you for your Thanks. Thanks. Next up is first reader JFA tuition, residency, and non residency. Good to see you both back. <laughs> Who are you going to call? <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. My name is James Torrance. I'm the staff specialist for strategy and compliance. Good evening, Jessica Wilson, director of strategy and compliance. Tonight we're presenting policy JFA tuition, residency, and non-residency first reader. This was first presented to policy committee back in September. To give you an idea, the current policy challenges, the current policy and regulations do not include specific language regarding school-based processes for enrolling non-resident students. And the distinction between programming for city residents and non-city residents is especially the access. And then funding, and funding to maximize supports for specific academic programs. In terms of that, we have key changes that we're proposing to JFA as well as its regula administrative regulation, which is JFARA. 
One is the process of enrolling non-city residents. So just to let you know, City Schools has rolled out a common, well, a common enrollment form. So a student from pre-K or a non-resident will have the same exact form. It allows us to capture their information, and this information will come to our enrollment choice transfer office. That way, our offices will be able to first look at whether we're doing a proper placement and confirm residency, and as well as, is this the efficient placement as well? Also, in terms of placement of students and non-student residents into entry criteria schools, we will separate the pool of students. There would be city residents and non-city residents. And then we also provide guidance on allocation of funding for non-city residents, for non-residential non funding. So if we have a seat capacity of 300 and we want to exceed that seat capacity, add maybe one non-city resident to that, to that freshman class at a high school or another school. So in our belief statement, we provide that we state affirmatively that we want to provide full access to free public education to all city residents, but we also want to implement a equitable and efficient process. So again, go back to that form and making sure that we have equity among our students and as well as any student entering from, an, from another jurisdiction. As well as we want to increase the number of high quality seats at our, at our rigorous academic programs. Key proposed changes is that the enrollment choice and transfer office will be the sole responsibility for enrolling students and have that power. As well as the, we outline specific actions that our personnel must take when enrolling students. That way we make sure that Collinson Square versus Johnson Square do not have a different enrollment form. We have an enrollment form that's common. We can capture information not only for our pre-K student, but a student coming from, a non, from a, another jurisdiction, as well as a military family, or even our homeless students. So this application queues up things that we need to know to make sure we make an informed decision and provides access to our students in multiple ways. As well as it does the city residents, we will not to give you an idea, it also ranks the city residents by their composite scores. We will not decrease the number of residency seats for non-resident seats. In terms of placement, again, we will not re reduce the number of seats. Again, we will also make sure that students and city programs and our city residents have preference in our academic programs. In terms of implementation, we want to make sure that we communicate the adherence to the new implementation process and how our school administrators and enrollment personnel will carry out this process, as well as communicate training to staff on how to do the enrollment process and also outreach with stakeholders and solicit feedback for policy and regulation updates because we recognize that this is tuition as well. And also, we want to ensure that all changes are communicated to students, families, and the public, and make sure inter internally that we disseminate the new actions that will come from the passage of this policy and the regulations. And also, shifting the relationship of ECT and how it relates to an engagement office and finance offices and other various stakeholders. And in terms of enrollment, in terms of engagement, we reached out to senior leadership, responsible offices. We're reaching out to various bargaining units. Just in FYI, next week we are going to have a focus group with the School of Arts. They have a large number of our tuition students, so it's best that we sit down with the families and the students who will be mostly affected by this policy change. Uh, I, I don't have a question. I just want to say I appreciate that attention to that detail that you just mentioned, the focus group. Commissioner High Cupboard. Yeah, I appreciate the detail on the policy and the regs as well. It's one one quick question. I didn't see School of the Arts actually listed in the policy, and because we actually offer them an opportunity to do a different process, we actually would be in violation of our own policy if we don't mention them specifically in the policy. Because I'm sorry, I mean I missed it, but I did read through the reg and the policy, and I didn't see reference to them. And they are allowed to do a different process in terms of, of out of district uh, acceptance. So. So in the regulation piece of it, we have a specific bullet about performing arts schools, which BSA would be covered under that. So we can revisit it and make sure that that's clear enough uh, that addresses that concern. I just want to make sure we're not in violation of our own. Mm -hmm. And if it's in, so uh, clarify that for me just for a moment. If it's in the reg, the reg is more about implementation, but our policy does say something different. So does it not need to be in the policy rather than the reg? I'm just... And you don't have to answer that now. Just think about it because I, the, I don't. I just don't want we us to be in the violation of the policy. That's something we'll consider. I mean, yeah. certainly double check with legal as well. Commissioner, just 
I can't answer part. If the regulation is not consistent with the policy, then the regulation itself is not valid. That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm not an attorney, so thank you for that. Any other questions on this? Thanks. Our final item is an, uh, the annual portfolio review, the 2017-2018 recommendations. Good evening. I'm Angela Alvarez. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of New Initiatives. Good evening, everyone. Teresa Jones, Chief Achievement and Accountability Officer. I'm Dana Polson with the Office of New Initiatives. <coughs> All right, and we're on this, um, this effort involves a lot of different offices. Um, it's important work um, every year. We're really looking carefully at what we're offering um, to our students, and so um, their staff kind of spread out who are deeply involved in making um, uh, these recommendations possible and really considering um, the ins and outs of everything. So I want to kind of just uh, publicly at the start just acknowledge the role that facilities planning um, and quite a few important people on the team are sitting over here uh, to the left of me. Um, the role the academic office plays in um, this engagement uh, communications OAA uh, who participates on both sides of the process that are two processes that are sort of going at the same time and uh, <laughs> we use a, a big portion of their team to crunch a lot of numbers um, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone school the uh, office of school support um, plays a big role um, so it's a whole team effort um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that at the start and I would also just acknowledge your role, Angela, in leading this and you did no woman's work. <laughs> so I wanted to remind, I was watching a board meeting a couple months ago. Or, you know, sometimes I feel like time in city schools is like dog years. <laughs> a couple of days feels a lot longer than it is. Um, but there was conversation around, you know, portfolio and the relationship between different things. So. For about 10 years, we've been a portfolio district. And so a lot of the things that we have, it was in the conversation around choice at neighborhood schools. All of that is part of being a portfolio, portfolio strategy. So the fact that um, our families have choice at the secondary level and some level of choice at the neighborhood level is part of being a portfolio strategy. That we fund schools on a per pupil basis is part of being a portfolio district. Um, that our schools have autonomy over their budgets, that we allocate to them rather than central office determining everything about uh, what makes the school's budget. Um, that we look at performance and hold schools accountable to performance as part of a process like this. Um, and that we engage the public and all of the um, key decisions that we make as a district. Um, that there's multiple um, sources of support and that we have a clear uh, kind of talent seeking strategy. Um, on the right, you can take some time, just kind of goes through the different phases and kind of where we are um, uh, in terms of uh, big things have happened in terms of implementing the strategy. Um, the, you know, the most important thing is that we are uh, ensuring our students have access to rigorous, robust programs in safe and healthy environments that promote success. Um, and to do that, we look at a range of factors every year when we do this review. We're looking at academic performance, climate, uh, access to programming, and increasingly we're looking at access. So when we get to uh, uh, another slide, we're going to talk about what that looks like in terms of access, uh, student enrollment and size, building utilization and condition, uh, as well as our implementation of the 21st century plan, 
and um, operator renewals for schools that are run by outside entities. Um, one of the big things is a, a, a big addition that came out of our uh, uh, Office of Planning uh, and was created um, uh, last school year in 2016-17 is a Community condi Conditions Index, um, which is really helping us to understand equity um, uh, in our district. Uh, so by looking at different neighborhoods and investment within those neighborhoods, whether that's access to social investment, financial, other kinds of assets that neighborhoods have, uh, and looking that with the, in, with the intersection of what city schools facilities um, investment is, our academic program investment, and our student achievement investment. So we're increasingly looking at that. And um, the, com the community in index, is, community conditions index, is looking at kind of three uh, measures, disparity, so looking at poverty rate, rates versus median um, household income, access to resources like healthy access to food or access to a ve vehicle, um, and then neighbor neighborhood stability and safety. Um, the table below depicts that in terms of um, both capital improvement projects and 21st century investment, we have a proportionate investment in our communities um, across the different um, levels of um, access to investment. So communities that have less resources, um, our investment in terms of those projects is proportionate um, to the percentage they make of our school district. Uh, and you can see that when you look at the different um, columns. So that's what this depicts. Um, we're using that community conditions index increasingly to understand how that impacts those communities as we make other decisions. So in the academic office, they've been very intentional in terms of how we expand access to our gifted and advanced learning programs. Um, and so this map shows the community condition index overlay with gifted and advanced learning um, um, programs throughout the district. So again, just highlighting how we're really using um, uh, that work cross departmentally to really get an equity in our district. Um, this year was a big year. Um, two of our um, schools opened this fall that are part of our 21st Century Buildings Project. So we had Fort Worthington, which uh, you can see pictures from grand opening day depicting um, students and staff, as well as their uh, library um, open this fall, um, as well as uh, Frederick Elementary School. Um, Frederick Elementary School um, uh, is now a charter school run by um, Baltimore Curriculum Project. Um, they operate four other uh, programs within our district, and again, you can see pictures from their opening day, um, as well as um, in front of their school building. Um, we have two more schools slated to open um, in the winter. So Lyndhurst will open, um, sorry, not winter, I guess, well, mid-year. <laughs> when uh, uh, Lyndhurst will open uh, mid-year, um, as well as now my mind is blinking. Um, John Eagle Howard, thank you. Dor or Dorothy I. Height, which I should not forget because she's a great person and was a well named, uh, selected by our, our students. All right, so we're going to um, get into recommendations just for the members of the public. So this kicks off um, our announcing formally what we're recommending um, to the board. Um, there will be a special session on November 28th. So that's an opportunity. Uh, for members of the public to sign up to um, share their feedback directly with the board um, so they can hear what you think about the recommendations. Um, there'll be a Comor hearing again for members of the public to again um, share that directly with the board and then the board will vote on December 19th. Um, there will be meetings at um, uh, schools uh, with recommendations um, to share that process and to take feedback um, from them uh, and members of the public can send uh, written to testimony directly to the board, and the board will consider that as, as part of its thinking around the recommendations. Um, some key areas of focus there this year, again, is around making sure that um, programs are able to be sustainable, um, that we're reviewing whether interventions have made changes in schools over time, um, ensuring there's availability of options for students, uh, and that we're meeting our 21st century program and buildings um, goals. This year we have um, five great reconfigurations up um, uh, as recommendations. Two of those were approved earlier in this year. That's for Calverton and James Mosher. 
Um, so you won't see them reflected in this presentation, but information about that can be found online. Uh, we have six program closure recommendations, two 21st century amendments, um, two school relocations, and three buildings up for surplus. We have 13 um, charter schools that are up for renewal this year, um, eight five-year recommendations, three three-year, one um, recommended for non-renewal, and one that is a pending recommendation. And we'll talk about that when we get there. All right, so we'll start with the three grade reconfigurations. First is Arlington Elementary Middle School. Uh, this was a school that was going to be changing from elementary middle to elementary grades alone at the same time that it would be moving into its new building and Pimlico would be moving into its new building. Pimlico would have been taking those middle grades. The school has asked to delay for a year the removal of the middle grades from its program so that it can simultaneously become the elementary and move into the new space at the same time. Uh, the second grade reconfiguration is Lois T. Murray Elementary Middle School. This is part of the 21st Century Plan that uh, Lois T. Murray also would become an elementary school. Um, middle school students who still require a separate public day school as part of their IEP would go to the Claremont School. Uh, the third grade reconfiguration is New Era Academy. The proposal is to change the grade configuration from a grade 6 to 12 school to a high school, grades 9 through 12 in the 18-19 school year. Uh, this is for a couple reasons. Uh, New Era has had a very, very small middle grades program and is having a difficult time providing robust programming to its students. Um, also, as part of this, if this recommendation is approved, students in the middle grades would go to Cherry Hill, which is going to have a brand new building. I just want to clarify, um, for students who live in the Cherry Hill community, the new Cherry Hill uh, is their zone school for students in grades three through eight, regardless of what we do for new era. Um, so they'll have access to that facility. Um, so that would just increase the pressure on new era in terms of being able to attract middle grade students. Um, so we're recommending that Ragnall Heights Elementary Middle School close um, this summer 2018. This is part of the 21st century plan. Um, so Lyndhurst Elementary will be opening um, uh, again mid-year. Uh, Ragnall Heights, if approved, Ragnall Heights students, um, would their zone will become part of the Lyndhurst zone. Um, the facility is being built for both school communities. They've been hard at work um, on uh, 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 joining together. Um, and so we're asking the, the board to go ahead and uh, formally approve the closure. Um, this is what the new facility, uh, uh, rendering what the new facility will look like. Um, and this depicts the expanded zone. Um, so if the board approves the closure, this uh, entire area in purple would be the new zone for the combined Lindhurst, uh, Ragnell Heights community. Um, we're asking the board to go ahead and also take a vote to close um, Carter G. Woodson, um, summer 2018, with a building surplus in 2020. Um, again, this is pursuant to the 21st Century Plan. Um, this uh, program is located in the Cherry Hill community. Um, so, um, under that proposal, under that plan, Arundel, um, both Arundel and Cherry Hill opened in the fall of 2018. So, students in grades pre K through grade two will attend Arundel. Students grades three through eight will attend Cherry, um, Cherry Hill Elementary Middle. Um, this depicts the expanded uh, zone um, and this, uh, the purple dots that you can see on your screen are um, the uh, current uh, students who are at Carter G. And then we're gonna go into um, new closure recommendations. Uh, Staff is recommending um, that uh, Coast Stream Park Elementary Middle School close in the summer 2018. Um, there are several reasons for this rationale. Um, one, this is a school that has struggled to be able to deliver strong outcomes for students. Um, uh, key items like state assessments, um, attendance has been lowered in district averages. Uh, additionally, the schools have struggled with in terms of enrollment. Uh, 
the enrollment has declined from 322 students in the 2015 school year to 237. Now, mind you, this is a school with nine grade levels, so that's very small. Uh, it makes it difficult to, for them to provide the kind of resources um, that students um, uh, need. Um, and close to the Code Stream Park are um, two program stadium, which is a middle school, and Abiston, which is an elementary school. They're successful programs. Um, they're favored by families. Uh, but they both are co-located in a very small um, uh, uh, building. Um, and so what staff is, so there's a, there, there's some related recommendations we're going to get to that's connected to this. Um, so if the board approves the closure of Coldstream, the students who um, live in Coldstream would be rezoned to Abiston, so Abiston zone would expand. Um, and uh, if you're a middle grade student, then you'll be designated to attend stadium. If families did not want to attend stadium, they can still participate in the choice process um, for another school, but they would have a, a guaranteed seat at stadium if they opted to take it. Um, um, so this is a picture of what the expanded um, zone would look like for the elementary students living in the area. Uh, as you can see, the schools are uh, uh, located close together. We're recommending that Friendship Academy of Engineering and Technology close in the summer 2018 and that we retain the facility. Um, this is a program that's also struggled to deliver strong outcomes for students. Um, performance on um, key things like the state assessment and their four-year cohort graduation rate um, have been below district averages. Um, student satisfaction is evidenced by the city school survey has declined over time. Uh, and so, and the schools struggled to um, establish a positive environment for teaching and learning. Uh, enrollment has also declined. Um, and we have more middle grades and high school seats uh, than we need in this part of the city. Sorry, Commissioner High Cupboard and Commissioner Canham. Yeah, how, how do you want to handle questions? As we go on each slide, because there's specific school related questions. Do you want me to stop between? If there are specific school related questions, let's take them now because it'll be too hard to remember yeah. them. But yeah. let's let's be brief about let's it. Let's be brief because it's a sixty nine page presentation. Yeah, I just want clarif <laughs> a clarification. <laughs> With on all due this respect. <laughs> just for context of a clarification question. Yeah. So we voted to close <coughs> the uh, sorry to end the relationship with the operator of the school. No, no. no. Um, so Friendship Academy of Engineering Technology a couple years ago was a transformation school. It had an outside um, operator yes. friendship. The operator decided um, to step away from the school. And we had voted for them, their other school to move. The, the operator the had operated two transformation schools within our district. Um, Friendship Academy of Science and Technology was the other um, program. That program which is a different program, but that program the board had um, voted to not renew and close. Thank you. So now this is a district operated school. That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Canham. Uh, just, just help me out because I am getting confused by the fasts. Um, is this the one, uh, this isn't the one on Northern Parkway. This is the one on Northern yeah, Parkway. This, is, this um, program is yeah, located yeah, in I'm Northern Parkway in the Professional Development right, Center. Right, got you. Um, thanks. And then I'm going back. Can I go back? Sure. To the last, I had a question on Cold Stream. Yes. Kashani, thank you. If they, st you said, I'm going back to Coldstream Elementary Middle School. If approved elementary students currently zoned to Coldstream Park will be zoned to Abbotston. C can they, can they all be absorbed? So I was going to, I was waiting because there's another kind oh, of, uh, okay, there's, it's it. connected. Um, but I can say now and then we can address further. I, but uh, later we're talking about, we have relocation recommendations. So we're recommending that stadium actually move into the Coldstream Park. If you approve this recommendation, that the stadium program move into that building, and that allows Abbotson to expand, and so they would have enough space, and allow stadium to expand, and they would have enough space. Okay, thank you. I, I've been part of, I, I've toured Abbotson, there's not a lot of space there, but that then makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah, some of these have related recommendations. Uh, we're recommending that the Knowledge and Success Academy um, well known as CASA program closed in the summer of 2018 and that we retain the facility for future use. Uh, this is another program that sh struggled to deliver um, strong outcomes for students. Um, performance on state assessments have been, been below the district average. Four-year cohort grant rates below the district ad average. Attendance has been declining. Declining enrollment uh, is too low to provide robust programming and has also declined over time. Again, 
was at the secondary level where we have more space than students. Um, and so we're recommending uh, that the program close. We're recommending that William Pender Hughes Elementary Middle School close in summer 2018 and that we retain the facility for future use. Um, this is a program um, that's had too few students to provide robust programming. Um, it's one of the uh, programs where the district has provided supplemental funding um, uh, due to its small size. Um, additionally, when you look at the area, um, there's another school that's nearby Gilmore Elementary. There are not enough students uh, who are elementary students who are in that area to sustain both schools. Um, so we're re recommending that Pender Hughes close. Um, if the board accepts that recommendation, we would rezone students um, to either Gilmore um, Elementary, the majority of them to Gilmore, or to Utah Marshburn based on geography. Um, both of these are elementary schools, so I just want to be really clear. So if the board accepts this, then middle school students would participate in choice. If it is approved, um, our office of enrollment, choice and transfer will go in and meet with families to help them find another option. Additionally, the board votes on December 19th, but choice applications are due a month later, so families have um, time to make informed decisions if the board accepts this uh, uh, recommendation. Just want to show the map really quickly. Um, so um, these are kind of the three zones. So the green outline is Gilmore Elementary. Um, in the middle is the current William Pender Hughes zone. And to the right in the orange outline is Utah Marshburn. That blue line, which is along Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, so the whole uh, Pender Hughes zone to the left of that blue line would be zoned to Gilmore. Um, and then the top portion that's to the right below North Avenue would be rezoned to Utah Marshburn. So just curious, on this one and a couple other slides, we've talked about K-8s. Are we making a distinct statement about not having more K-8s, moving them away from a K-8 model? I mean, I just, I don't know why we wouldn't think about, and I'm curious, so the answer, why Gilmore or Utah wouldn't go to a K-8, do they not have space? Or are we being intentional about having sort of different middle school thought process here? Yeah, I mean, as a portfolio district, I think we believe in having a variety of options. So this is not. And we're under not a statement on K-8s. So I think that that okay. works. So this is really about the context of the community. Um, one of the challenges when we look at things from a facility, so, so there's being able to fund programming from a student, number of student perspective, right? And so being able to afford the number of teachers, um, the number of resources, number of programs you have. And there, then there is uh, how many students can you actually fit in a facility? which are two separate things. Mm -hmm. um, as we all know, we have some of the oldest infrastructure in the state. And so um, when we look at our elementary schools or our elementary middle schools, they're in tiny buildings. Um, many of them, when we moved to elementary middle for some of them, were in element buildings that were designed just to be elementary schools. They weren't designed to be elementary middle schools at that time. I think that's why 21st century is so important and some of the other um, things that we're doing are so important. But it just creates... Uh, challenge when you're trying to ensure that there's enough students for our schools to really be able to provide what students need uh, with ensuring there's enough space for students to have their needs met from that perspective. Um, and one of the things, too, about um, this proposal, both Gilmore and Utah Marshburn offer gifted and advanced learning, or Pender Hughes currently does not. So that's something that the students would immediately ben benefit from. Same thing with Coldstream. So Coldstream currently is not able to um, offer gifted advanced learning, but both Stadium and um, Abbotson offer that. So that's another thing that they would immediately be able to benefit if you uh, approve this. So, but Gilmore and North Utah have the space to offer a K-8? I'm just, that's not no. realistic for them? Okay. All right, there are three buildings that we are recommending be surplus this year to the city of Baltimore. Uh, the Patapsco building, which has been used as swing space. Uh, the Rogno Heights building at the end of the year, once Rogno Heights is ready to move into the Lindhurst building. And then finally, the West Side building, which has also been used as swing space. These will no longer be needed for educational purposes by city schools as of uh, summer of 2018. Uh, next, we have two amendments to the 21st Century Buildings Plan. 
The first is staff is recommending that we change the surplus date for the surplusing of the Northwestern building from 2019 to 2021. Uh, this is so that the space could be used as swing space for additional schools in the 21st century buildings plan. Next, the uh, Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson building. Likewise, we were recommending a change in the surplus state from 2018 to 2020. It's also so that it can be used as swing space for additional 21st century schools. Uh, there are two program relocations being proposed. These are both linked to closures that Angela has just described. So first off, if the recommendation to close the Coldstream Park program is taken, uh, there's an associated recommendation to move this stadium school to the Coldstream building. Um, as she described, both Stadium and Abbotston are very small and in a small building. If it's allowed to move, they will have more space to grow. I just want to add that those are programs that we believe will go out. There is high, there's interest in those programs, and it's the space that limits their size. Thank you. And then second, Blueford Drew Jemison STEM Academy West. If the proposal to close CASA, which is currently co-located with BDJ in the Walbrook building, if the board approves that recommendation, uh, BDJ would be left in the Walbrook building by itself. It's a very, very large building and a fairly small program. Uh, staff is recommending that BDJ relocate to the Harlem Park building where it would be co-located with the Augusta Fells Savage program. Uh, this would provide better utilization of the Harlem Park building, meaning that if that building should need uh, capital repairs under state programs, they would be able to qualify more easily. It also makes both programs just more sustainable, being in a more suitably sized building. Uh, and the last one, it's, it's related, it's informational. So this is not a, this is about a program, not a school. Um, so it's at the purview of the CEO. Um, so uh, it's related to um, uh, the relocation, the proposed relocation of BDJ to the Harlem Park building. Um, the elementary middle alternative program is currently located and a portion of the space that would be used by BDJ. So if the board approves the relocation of BDJ, um, then uh, Dr. Sansalisas would um, have uh, the EMAP program move to the uh, Elmer Portable Facility um, in the summer of 2018. Um, the Elementary Middle Alternative Program is a program that's designed um, for students to attend for limited specific periods of time. Um, for elementary students, is around uh, behavioral um, interventions, um, and for there is a small um, underage overcredited program uh, for middle grade students. Um, sometimes they're year they're there from one school year to the next. I want to be transparent about that. Um, the Elmer Portables are um, located on uh, uh, transportation lines that are easily accessible, and so because students are coming from all over the city, uh, we think it makes sense um, in a lot of ways to use that facility for this program. Um, but the students themselves are enrolled in other schools um, when they're attending this program. Okay, and so we're gonna um, get into the operator renewal um, um, portion of the, um, so we're gonna just do a little swap out. Um, so on a uh, three to five year cycle, um, different schools will come up for um, review as part of this process every year for you but for individual schools it's every three to five years um, that they go through the renewal process um, it's governed by policy IHB um, there are three key components that we look at student achievement school climate financial management and governance I'm just going to pause so another member of the team can introduce himself hi I'm Trevor Roberts of the office of new initiatives So this next slide is intended to provide just an overview of some of the key changes that were made for the renewal rubric. As you will recall, every year as we go through the operator renewal process, we take feedback, we continue to take a look at where we are in terms of various data and indicators available to look at school performance. As a result of that, uh, we do typically make some uh, small adjustments from year to year. Um, this captures some of those key changes for this, uh, this particular cycle. 
So first, in looking at the use of the PARC data for English language arts and mathematics, um, looking at the mean scale scores um, over the course of the three-year period, so looking at trend, um, so how have schools performed over that duration of that time period, as well as looking at growth. We also have been having ongoing conversations around how do we take a look at comparing schools um, so that we're looking at similar schools and how they're performing relative to one another. So one of the things that we've done this year is particularly for the absolute component and for the absolute component only of PARC um, is taking a look at using the economic disadvantage level, so looking at poverty as a way to identify like schools and then comparing their results on PARC, again, solely for the absolute component. The reason for that, just as a reminder, is that when we take a look at the data, we actually show that there is a strong correlation between the absolute proficiency rates on most standardized assessments and poverty. So to not account for that in some ways um, doesn't really give us a good sense around how schools are actually addressing the needs of students at different poverty rates. In addition to that, we also have looked at the college and career readiness measures um, and making sure that those are more closely aligned to what MSDE is using. Most folks will remember, we now have the College and Career Readiness and Completion Act of 2013. And as a function of that, we've tried to streamline and align the measures across the board around how the state is defining college and career readiness and how we're looking at it here for city schools. Uh, so the renewal. The renewal timeline is similar um, to the other, but there are some key things that I want to make sure that uh, people are aware of in terms of the process. Um, so the schools themselves submit applications. So we look at um, a variety of key data points as well as applications submitted and evidence submitted by the schools themselves about what they're doing around the key indicators. Our um, charter and operator-led advisory board, also known as the New and Charter School Advisory Board, reviews those applications and the materials um, over a period of time, it makes recommendations to the CEO. Um, renouncing today, there's a special uh, there's a special board work session uh, for operators um, to uh, share their feedback directly with the board. That happens on November 28th, um, and then the board will um, do its uh, final vote on the same um, day uh, as other schools. Um, the first school that's up for a recommendation, the CEO is recommending a five-year renewal for Afia Public Charter School. Um, they're highly effective in absolute performance on the math um, six through eight park, uh, placing an 86 percentile uh, of its grade um, band based on economic disadvantage. They're effective on the English language arts for middle grades in the 76 percentile for economic disadvantage, uh, effective in trend, highly effective in effective instruction, which comes from our school effectiveness review, which is a kind of site visit that looks at whether staff are able to plan and deliver effective academic instruction to students and whether schools establish an environment in which uh, teaching and learning can occur. Um, they're highly effective in parent, student, and staff satisfaction as evidenced by city school school survey. Um, before we move on, there's a complete report that's available online where you can see each indicator and how they perform. So these are just, all these slides just highlight some of the uh, key indicators, but not all of them. Um, so for the members of the public who are interested, they can look online um, uh, to see those. The next school is Baltimore International Academy, which is also being recommended for a five-year renewal. This school is operated by Benner Baltimore International Incorporated. Um, you'll see here overall ratings effective for academic performance and climate, and that they also met expectations and were considered highly effective in the areas of financial management and governance. In terms of specifics, some of the highlights here include uh, their highly effective performance as it relates to PARC on the absolute performance. Again, taking a look at how they performed relative to their economically disadvantaged uh, comparison group. They had a mean scale score of 729, which put them in the 85th percentile. Looking at English language arts, they, they were placed in the 77th percentile. Looking at math, um, they were developing, um, placing in the 50th percentile. And then for ELA, for grades three to five, they were in the 19th percentile. Looking at their performance on the school effectiveness review, they were given a highly effective rating. Again, looking at that component of the review, which looks at whether school staff are able to plan and deliver effective academic instruction to students and whether the school has established an environment in which teaching and learning can occur. Looking at fidelity to charter, they were also given a highly effective rating. Looking at how well the school communicates and implements its mission and vision, whether or not they deliver high, high quality programming to all to its students, 
and using data to identify and address achievement gaps in subgroup performance. Also looking at the school survey results, they were given a highly effective rating in student, family, and staff satisfaction. The next school is the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women, which is operated by the Foundation for Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women Incorporated. This school is also being recommended for a five-year renewal. Ratings for this school were the academic performance rating of highly effective, climate of effective, financial management and governance of meets expectations and effective respectfully, uh, respectively. Um, this is a charter that actually serves grades six through 12. Looking at their ratings, um, again, here, because we are looking at a grade six to 12, we have a college and career readiness measure. Um, they were given an effective rating in this area, which looks at participation as well as success in key preparation, um, college preparation indicators, such as the SAT, ACT, AP, and IB, or International Baccalaureate Exam Performance, um, and also looking at college credit bearing coursework or dual enrollment. Uh, we also look at um, completion of a CTE pathway. Um, and looking at college enrollment within 16 months of graduation. Also, in terms of their four-year cohort graduation rate, they were deemed highly effective with 95% of diploma track seniors in the cohort graduating. Um, in terms of their absolute park performance, they were also given a highly effective rating, um, looking at the math six to grade six to eight, where they placed in the 90th percentile within their comparative economic disadvantage group. English language arts, they were at the top in the 100th percentile. Uh, for English language arts 10, um, they were um, also in the 100th percentile at the top of, of their peer group. And as it relates to Algebra 1, they were deemed um, effective, placing in the 77th percentile. In terms of the school effectiveness review highlights um, through the talented people area, they were also given a highly effective rating. And that looks at how a school selects, evaluates, and retains effective teachers. Okay, our next school is City Neighbors Charter School, operated by City Neighbor Charter School Incorporated. They're a charter that serves grades K through eight, and the CEO is recommending a three-year renewal. Um, they're rated developing and academic performance, highly effective in climate, and meets expectations effective in financial management and governance. Some of the um, specifics are they're rated not effective in absolute park performance in math, math three through five, uh, ranking the sixth percentile in their economic disadvantage group. Um, they're in the 31st percentile for math six through eight and um, 19th percentile for English three through five and 31st percentile in ELA six through eight. They're rated developing in park achievement growth, which assesses changes in student achievement over time and math six through eight and ELA three through five rated not effective in math three through five and ELA six through eight. Um, they were rated effective in fidelity to charter, which looks at how well the school communicates and implements its mission and vision, whether the school delivers high quality programming to its students and uses data to identify and address achievement gaps in subgroup performance. And uh, we would like to note that gaps were noted in subgroup performance between African American and white students. Um, for example, on math three through five, uh, there was a gap of 24 scale score points ELA three through five had a gap of 23 scale score points, um, as well as math six or eight, and ELA six or eight showed us a gap of 24 points. Creative, Creative City is recommended for a three-year renewal. Um, they had a mix of indicators, so um, they were uh, not effective in absolute park performance on uh, math three to five, um, being scored in the 15th percentile, uh, and in the English language arts, um, scored in the 27th percentile for that area. Um, not effective in park achievement on growth, uh, which is looking at student achievement over time, the 25th percentile for math, 10th percentile for English language arts. They're highly effective in vision and engagement based on the SER, which looks at a school's ability to provide a safe and supporting learning environment for students, families, teachers, and staff, and highly effective in parent and staff satisfaction, developing in student satisfaction as evidenced by City Schools School Survey. The next school is the Crossroads School, which is uh, operated by Living Classrooms Foundation. This charter is being recommended for a five-year renewal with academic performance and climate falling in the effective categories and financial management and governance and meets expectations and highly effective respect, 
respectively. In terms of highlights, um, in terms of absolute park performance in math grades six to eight, they were deemed highly effective, looking at them scoring at the top of their economic disadvantage comparison group. Um, and then for English language arts grades six to eight, they were in the 97th percentile. In terms of growth, growth which assesses changes in student achievement over time, they were, in, they were considered developing, um, rating in the 59th and 57th percentiles re respectively, respectively for math and ELA. In terms of fidelity to charter, they were rated highly effective. Again, fidelity to charter, looking at how well the school communicates and implements its mission and vision, looking how they hi deliver high quality programming and how they use data and address achievement gaps and subgroups. Looking at cohort retention, which measures the number of students who remain with the school at least two years after their initial entry over time, they were rated highly effective. The next school is Empowerment Academy, uh, which is operated by the Empowerment Center. This school is also being recommended for a five-year renewal. This is a charter serving grades K to eight. It was deemed effective in academic performance, <coughs> climate, and governance, and meets expectations for financial management. Key points here uh, in terms of their park absolute performance, they were rated highly effective, rating in the 92nd percentile as it relates to math grades three to five. They were at the top of their peer group in math six to eight at 100th percentile rating. In terms of English language arts, they were in the 92nd percentile. And then for uh, the next one, we also, I think one of these is a typo. Uh, ELA six to eight, uh, 83rd percentile. That's correct. Um, in terms of looking at their growth, um, they were deemed highly effective, scoring in the 93rd percentile for ELA six to eight effective in math six to eight at the 70th percentile and ELA at the 74th percentile and developing in math when it comes to the 62nd percentile. They were also deemed effective in fidelity to charter and highly effective in cohort retention. Okay, the next school is Hampstead Hill Academy. They're operated by the, by the Baltimore Curriculum Project. Um, the recommendation is for a five-year renewal. They're rated highly effective in, in academic performance, climate, and in financial management and governance. Um, some of the specifics are that they're highly effective in absolute park achievement, um, in English language arts three through five at the 81st percentile in their ED comparison group, math six through eight at the 85th percentile, ELA six through eight in the 92nd percentile, and they're rated effective in math three through five in the 69th percentile in their ED group. Um, they're rated highly effective in park achievement growth for math three through five, ELA three through five, math six through eight, and ELA six through eight. Um, they get highly effective rating in parent, student, and staff satisfaction as shown by the city schools school survey. Um, and again, this, there were gaps noted with this school in uh, subgroup performance uh, between white students, African-American students, and Latino students. Um, gaps were seen um, from 29 percentage points in ELA three through five between white and African-American students. Um, the gap between white and Latino students for that test was 32 points. And gaps ranging from 17 to 35 points are present in all other uh, park ass assessments in the 16-17 school year. <laughs> uh, Independent school, local one high is a high school. Um, the uh, recommendations for a non-renewal um, and closure in, at the end of the school year. Um, this school received a developing uh, in each category. Um, some of the key indicators, they were uh, rated not effective in college and career readiness, uh, which measures participation and success in important college prep indicators, SAT, ACT, IB, college credit, um, coursework. CTE and college enrollment 16 months after graduation. They were not effective in their four-year cohort grad rate. Um, there's a typo on this slide. 66.7% uh, of their diploma track students and the four-year cohort graduation rate um, graduated. They were, um, they were highly effective in absolute park achievement in the English language arts. Um, of, um, in the 100th percentile of their ED comparisons group, group and developing in Algebra 1. Uh, with a, uh, in the 50th percentile of their ED comparison group, 
through developing strategic leadership, which measures um, how well the school leadership sets goals and allocates resources and how the operator or board of director oversees school operations. Uh, also notable is this school has received multiple three-year renewals um, and uh, it remains in developing in these kind of categories. Can I ask you a question about that one? Yep. I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. So they're not effective in their four-year is it, there's a typo. It, we should have caught it. it. It should say, so we have to correct it. It should say 60, I think my memory is that it's 66.7. Right. It's, they're like, not 95 percent. That sounds pretty effective to me. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Okay. All righty. Our next school is Midtown Academy, uh, which is being recommended for a five-year renewal. This is a charter that serves grades K to 8 and is operated by Midtown Academy Incorporated. They received a highly effective rating in both academic performance and climate, meets expectations and effective, respectively, for financial management and governance. Looking at their park achievement on an absolute basis, they were deemed highly effective, rating in the 88th percentile on their ELA grades 3 to 5 and also uh, for their 81st percentile for math 3 to 5. They were effective in ELA 6 to 8, scoring in the 69th percentile, and math 6 to 8, as well as scoring in the 69th percentile. On the great growth basis, they were deemed highly effective, um, and they scored a 99th percentile for math 3 to 5, 92nd percentile for math 6 to 8, 92nd percentile again for ELA 6 to 8 and effective in ELA 3 to 5 with a 74th percentile ranking. Looking at fidelity to charter, they were deemed highly effective as well as highly effective as evidenced by the city school school survey and parent, student, and staff satisfaction. The next school is Patterson Park Public Charter School, operated by Patterson Park Public Charter School Incorporated. This is a charter school serving grades K to 8 that's being recommended for a five year renewal with highly effective ratings in academic performance and climate. For financial management and governance, they were given a meets its expectations and effective rating, respectively. Looking at their absolute park performance, they scored at the top at 100th percentile for their. ED comparison group on ELA grades 3 to 5, making them highly effective. Also for math grades 3 to 5, they were in the 96th percentile. For ELA 6 to 8, they were in the 94th percentile. And they were effective in math 6 to 8, scoring in the 78th percentile. On the park achievement growth, they scored highly effective, looking at scores ranging from a 97th percentile for math 3 to 5 to 98th percentile for ELA 3 to 5 effective in math 6 to 8 at the 71st percentile and ELA 6 to 8 at the 79th percentile. They were also deemed highly effective as evidenced by their city school school survey results looking at parent, student, and staff satisfaction. For this school there were some noted uh, performance gaps as it relates to performance of white students in comparison to African American and Latino students. Um, you'll see notations here, a gap of 55 scale score points, um, looking at performance comparisons between white and African American students in grades ELA 6 to 8, and 46 points between white and Latino students in that same assessment. Looking at other park assessments, there were gaps ranging from 32 to 49 points. Okay, here we have Southwest Baltimore Charter School, operated by Southwest Baltimore Charter School Incorporated. They're a charter school serving grades K through 8, and they're being recommended for a three-year renewal. Their academic performance is rated developing. Climate is effective. Financial management and governments is meets expectations and effective. They're rated effective in absolute park achievement in ELA 3 through 5 and the 69th percentile in their ED comparison group. Um, also effective in math 3 through 5 in the 76th percentile rated not effective in ELA 6 through 8 in the 29th percentile and in math 6 through 8 in the 48th percentile. Um, they were rated effective in park achievement growth for math 3 through 5 and ELA 3 through 5, but rated not effective in math 6 through 8 and ELA 6 through 8. They're effective in cohort retention, and uh, again, gaps were noted at this school between um, performance of African American and white students um, with uh, gaps ranging from 22 uh, to 25 scale score points in ELA 3 through 5 and math 3 through 5. Um, 
Finally, we have one recommendation that's pending. It's for Banneker Blake uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, typically, um, the uh, original contract for a school going through renewal is a five-year period. This school is going through its first renewal, but it had a three-year um, uh, uh, term, conditional um, term set by the board and approval of it. Um, uh, so uh, in the area of financial management in particular, um, that's a review of the school's audits over time. It's a lagging indicator. So when we have a school that's been around for five years, we'll have three years of audits. Since this program is only three years old this year, that means we have one year. Um, so it's a pending. We need to look at uh, at least two years of financial audits to get a sense of a school, particularly a school that's growing. Um, so their second uh, audit uh, will be ready this year. We've asked them to prioritize getting that to us sooner than later. So the vote, you won't take a vote on this school on December 19th. We're uh, hoping to do the vote in January. Um, we wanna give them enough time to get the audit to us so that it can be reviewed by finance, shared with the uh, advisory board, as well as the CEO uh, to finalize a recommendation around this school. Um, for other data points, we did have data. So that's the only thing that we're kind of re we're waiting on. Nationally, fi finance is the thing that uh, where uh, charters struggle. And so we need to make sure they're on sound financial footing uh, uh, so that it does not put our students at risk. So that's why we're asking the board to wait um, on, uh, on voting on this. Uh, in terms of their uh, performance, um, they were highly effective in the park achievement growth uh, measure. Um, being scoring in the 81st percentile um, for their um, middle grade grade band and the 84th percentile. They were effective in absolute um, for math and uh, in ELA. They were uh, not effective for students with disabilities. Um, and again, we're waiting on the um, second audit, uh, hopefully to be able to take a vote in January. Uh, if members of the pu public have any questions, you can direct questions to the annual portfolio review questions mailbox. It sits in my mailbox and mem other members of the team, so it comes to a real person or real people. Uh, and you can send commentary directly to the board at portfolio recommendations. We ask that you use that email address rather than the board's regular email address so that they can pay special attention um, and review those uh, that testimony. Thank you. So thanks for the terrific presentation. People had questions along the way, but let's now see what we have at the end. Uh, Commissioner High Cupboard. Uh, two questions. One, the schools that receive developing in one of the more areas, if we decide to approve them in, after future deliberation and whatnot, are they required to submit some kind of statement of how they're going to come out of developing for those areas? What, what, is, the what, what is the requirement for us if we just give them a three or a five? Or can we attach that um, if they're so? Um, so if you approve the if you approve them at a three year, remember the kind of the theory of action around having charter or outside entities is that they're autonomous, that they do the work and we review the outcomes, and that we're not necessarily prescriptive about how they arrive at those outcomes beyond making sure they follow Comar or key district laws or state laws regulations. But that's not being um, prescriptive. That's asking them to tell us how they're coming out of that. I mean, that's what I'm asking. I mean, you can put conditions. Um, I, uh, you know, we've had one school that had like a conditional uh, renewal. Um, um, uh, I think there's challenges when you have, I don't know that that necessarily changes practice. I will say that um, we look, every time we, we kind of go through renewal, there's this whole question around, three years and will uh -huh. schools pay attention? Uh, and I can share the numbers and we can look at what the numbers are today. But when we look back for most of those schools, many of them went to five years in the subsequent kind of renewal. They didn't stay um, in the three-year status. So you, you, we do see when we review these applications, schools uh, really changing practice and really monitoring um, those areas of weakness. Um, it's why um, both the CEO and the advisory board wanted to call attention to, to subgaps. That's something that we, you know, as we're talking about equity, something that we want to look at. I would say many of these schools in their applications address that uh, uh, forthright and have um, clear plans and um, processes around how they're dealing with that. Um, uh, and some are very, very thoughtful uh, in terms of doing like implicit bias training and really looking at the role other things 
play into how we instruct students and not just adding more math <laughs> um, uh, because there's a lot more that goes into that. So um, I think a three year, you know, you, can you? Yes, absolutely. You, you, can, you can modify the recommendation um, to include requirements. Um, I think it's just challenging to monitor and, and you know, I, I hesitate to put a paper requirement that we're not going to review on top of all the other things that schools have to do. Um, uh, in terms of we, if you, we feel that their performance is strong enough to merit a three-year renewal, I think we should give them the three-year renewal. So if we I think ask, that it's not, then you should vote not to give them the three-year renewal. I ask, and I can wait till the school's here to sort of talk to them directly, but we have a school here who had a three-year before, had a developing before in the exact same area, and it hasn't changed. And so I'm sitting here being asked to consider a renewal for them when they've made no improvement from the last time we asked, or, or significant improvement from the last time they went through this process. So that's why I'm asking what sort of leeways we have. But I'll ask them directly when they come before us to talk about this, and then we can sort of think that through. My other question, though, quickly is um, under, we have several schools that are highly effective reservating for academics, and yet their achievement gaps between African American and white students are severe. So I'm trying to understand how that, I understand there could be other areas around progress and that kind of thing, but I'm having a problem with the fact that there's a severe gap there and they're still being rated as highly effective. I get effective because of the other areas, but I'm not sure how you can be highly effective and have that severe of a gap. So remember for, for absolute, for trend, and for growth, those measures are based on your, prepare, your, uh, your overall school performance compared to other schools um, based on uh, test agreed band. And in the case of absolute, it throws in the layer of looking at economic disadvantage. It's not taking into consideration your subgroup performance. That's a more qualitative measure. That's part of the fidelity to charter um, uh, measure that the advisory board reviewed. And so part of what schools address in their applications, which you all also have, um, are what they're doing about their subgroup gaps. Uh, it's notable that quite a few of the schools, not true of all of them, but a few of the schools that are in this batch that have subgroup gaps, when you look at the performance of those individual, uh, like their African American students, they're above the district averages, in some cases well above. So it, it, when we look at subgroup, it's complicated. It's not just um, one thing. And so um, I think it's something, as a district, we need to be looking at more closely. Uh, and, and, and it's, you know, it's a national kind of conversation about what you do and how you, how you move that. Um, but within their applications, many of these schools were thoughtful about what they're doing and had specific plans to deal with that. But it's not something that I think, I think as a nation, we haven't really come up with a, a good answer about how to fix it. I think the other consideration as well is just looking at the size of those subgroups. For many of our schools, we don't have a very diverse population to begin with. Mm -hmm. So you've got small numbers of students being compared to larger mm -hmm. numbers of students. And when you look at it on a percentage basis, that's where you start to see the gaps. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just a little bit of a watch out, I think, in terms of just how we look at the numbers. Angela's exactly right. It is a national phenomenon, and it's one that we're still trying to sort of tease out. What does it mean in the context of the work that we're doing here, especially in light of our focus around equity, and how do we get those numbers in front of folks in a way that they can actually make sense of so that people are not thrown off, number one, when we bring these gaps to their attention, and number two, that is something that they're planning for, not just because of park scores, but because of everything else that they're doing to educate students based on what they know their needs are. Yeah. We were saying that we didn't know the end either, which is, was problematic, obviously. But given that you have this slide, like are any one of these schools, and you only have this much information on it, but it says highly effective at the top, and the bottom line says this gap, it's problematic for the public to look at that and say we're still saying that they're fantastic when it's saying there's a severe gap. So but we need to tweak what we're saying about this so it's very clear to the public what we mean by that. So we'll, we'll, we'll take that. a, we'll take a hard, look at the... It's hard in a slide, right? I get got it. it. Yeah. It's just, I want the optics yeah. to be right on this. So we'll take we'll take a look at our slides um, uh, to make sure that they're not confusing to members of the public. Yeah. I, I do think though that to the point that this is a national issue, it's also a state yeah. issue. Yeah. And across our state, there are schools um, in a variety of districts that are ranked highly that have gaps that are just as large in, in these schools. And so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it is, it is something that the nation is dealing with. It is something that, you know, from my previous 
group of work um, that you can take two schools that folks think are fantastic schools, highly ranked, large numbers of kids scoring at four and five, and when you pull out mm -hmm. um, the subgroup performance, you see huge gaps in one of the schools, and there are two schools that can look very similar um, on the surface, but when you disaggregate the subgroup, you see who actually is moving and who is not. And you know, to the team's credit, um, we continue to struggle with this. I mean, and we continue to work through it, but it is, without a doubt, a national problem. I think the state board um, needs to continue to wrestle with this. We, we, there, there are schools and communities that people think are wonderful, but they're not looking at the subgroup data. And I think a point of advocacy across the state is a level of, and you know, Teresa and I have had this conversation, we do not in this state disaggregate by a cross-section of, of, of SES level and race and ethnicity and EL, right, status. We don't, we reject those complexities and so it's not just in Baltimore City that you see this. We, you could dig up data in other jurisdictions, it's just that we have to be able to keep that out front. But to your point, you know, we, we, we should wrestle with what it means to, to call a school highly effective when there are 30% gaps um, in, in particular. Agreed. Well, but, okay. And I do think that we should be, you know, every year we look at the um, renewal, at the end of the renewal process we do a debriefing. And I think this is one thing we've talked about for many years, is what is the best way to represent this data. Currently it's something we talk about with regard to the, um, when we look at the f fidelity to charter measure, but is that the best way to do it or do we need to break it out? Does it need to be a separate measure? Um, so I think that that's an ongoing conversation we need to have. Um, having it within fidelity to charter makes it a more subjective measure and is that the best way to handle it? So. I I mean, we've been serious about it. We've always flagged it as an issue. It, is, it has changed the renewals from five years to three years when we've seen gaps that are large enough. Um, and so we, we've taken it seriously. But I do agree that there's, I mean, the challenge is that those ratings you see on the slide are, you know, as a result of the renewal rubric. And so they're the result of the measures that are there. The question are, should other measures be there in order to reflect this issue? Commissioner Hassan. So one thing I just want to put a flag in for the debriefing that's going to happen after the process is I think we talked about it a little bit last year, but it didn't get much traction about what do we do about multiple three-year renewals and do we put a cap on how many three years? And then on the other side of that, if we have someone that's had a successful five-year renewal, do we go with now you have a 10-year option? So, so just how do we balance the onerous need to do deep dive reviews with the need to have a system that's that's up to speed quick. So can I just jump in on the three year mm -hmm. renewal? So we um, so that has come up really every year that we've gone through renewal. Um, we talk about it and it just want to remind you that the board policy is really clear that you a school can have multiple three year renewals, but the board has the prerogative to say that they don't want to give multiple three year renewals. So it's in the policy. So the board is within the board's policy to say that you don't want to give three year renewals. So I don't think this it's a change is required in the policy. It's it's a discussion that the board should have whether they whether they want to do that or not. Um, and um, so yeah. I I, I hear you and I think that that's lovely that the flexibility is there. I think we might want to think about looking at it though as what it might set us up for liability wise if well why this school and why not that school. So we in the past so we can in the past when we've talked about it, the decision of the board was I mean this is in, over a few years the decision always was that they decided not to do a, a policy change they wanted to leave it with the flexibility but we can revisit it. Yeah. I, I, I do want to I do want to add though just and emphasize what the chief of staff has said is that the flexibility is not to imply that the board could not previously nor currently do that so I think part of it is also wrestling with what the board could do if the board decided to do it. The implications though are things that staff could help within the decision. So if in that process you would like to know what the implications might be, that is fine. But I also don't want to neuter the board when the policy does not do that. Policy has always permitted the board to say we want to limit the number of three year renewals. That There's no shift in that. That power has always been there and remains there. Commissioner Cooper. On a three-year renewal piece, I think what's being, not being said and possibly suggested is maybe the flexibility should not be there. 
maybe it should be a hard and fast rule because we run into a circumstance where if we allow flexibility, that also permits a significant amount of liability because we would then have to defend why we choose to not renew this school and choose to renew this school. That causes us maybe more problems. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the flexibility is probably the problem if folks think that there should be a cap on three-year renewals. So I think as Chief of Staff Perkins Cohen said, it's, and Commissioner Hassan raised it, let's go through the process and then let's revisit it. Because it does keep coming up because it's problematic. It, it begs the question. Any other questions on this? Okay, thank you very much. We, I, we do, it's maybe, it's, I'm just saying that the hard work, yeah, go I was just going to say, it's, it's, you, it's pre delivered in a smooth way, but uh, we, we do understand how much work goes into this, so thank you. So what I'd like to take the time to do now as we close is to just review um, a, a long list of upcoming meetings. And this, as uh, Angela said, this just, this does kick off the beginning of the portfolio renewal process. So there's going to be a number of points along the way where you'll be able to hear more about this. So in chronological order, starting with tomorrow night, uh, there's the district community meeting about the FY1819 budget at Douglas. On uh, Thursday, there's two meetings, one the same district community meeting but at another location at Poly. Those are both at 6. Uh, the PCAB meeting is in this room at, at also on, on Thursday at 6.30. Then next week, we've got the operations committee meeting in this room on the 21st at 10. Policy committee on the 21st at 3.30 in this room. Teaching and learning on the 28th at 9 a.m. in this room. The next board meeting, um, executive session at 3 upstairs, and then uh, the operator renewal work session in this room at 5 p.m., um, followed by um, special session for public testimony on annual portfolio review at 7. There is an inclement weather date for that on November 30th. Um, as Commissioner Hassan noted earlier, on November 30th, there will be a uh, board forum on the district legislative platform, November 30th at 6. Uh, a board forum on fair student funding, discussion of the updated model on December 11th at Douglas High School. Uh, the Comar hearing uh, on the portfolio review. This is a special scheduled meeting on December 12th at 7. The inclement weather date is on the 14th. Uh, the board vote on the portfolio review is in this room on December 19th at 6. There is an inclement weather date for that on December 20th. And then that's that. Any questions on the upcoming schedule? If no, hearing none, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Uh, moved by Commissioner Berkeley, second. Bondima, second. All in favor? I, this meeting is officially adjourned. At 929. <laughs>